Um, thank you. I do see that you're in a, in a conference room. And so when we go on our streaming, it, uh, I'll just need to maybe be reminded of names because we can't quite see you and I don't have the benefit of the little, um, the name. So um, maybe each time you speak, if you find us of your names, but I'm so glad to see you. And I thank each of you for joining us. Um, the Gaming Commission meets publicly and we have to do that pursuant to the open meeting law. So we also stream as a courtesy so that folks can access us easily. So with that, good morning and uh, Dave, we're all set to go. Yep, okay. Thank you. All set. Thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone. This is a convening of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission because we're doing this virtually. I need to take a roll call. Good morning, Commissioner O'Brien. Good morning, I'm here. Good morning, Commissioner Hill. Good morning, I'm here. Good morning, Commissioner Skinner. Good morning. And good morning, Commissioner Maynard. Good morning, I'm here. Excellent. So today is January 10th and it is public meeting number 421. And we are continuing our evaluation of category three um, sports wagering online operators applications. And today we're very pleased to have um, presentation and demonstration of, and uh, consideration of the application of better. So, um, and actually it's the full name is Better Holdings Inc. But we'll say better today. And uh, we are looking forward to your presentation. Uh, good morning. My good, good morning. Yes, hi. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. My name is Ashwin Krishna, and I'm Head of Legal and Business Affairs at Better Holdings Inc., also known as Better. On behalf of everyone at Better, we want to thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today uh, about our organization and appreciate all of the hard work and efforts of the commissioners and the staff at the Massachusetts Gaming Commission to allow for sports wagering in the Commonwealth in such a thoughtful, deliberate, and responsible manner. We look forward to speaking with you today about our product, our marketing plans, our values, and our commitment to offer the residents of Massachusetts a safe and responsible way in which to participate in sports wagering. We welcome your questions and feedback and would be honored and privileged to receive a Category 3 sports wagering operator, operator license from the Massachusetts Gaming Commission. I'm joined today by several of my colleagues, including the following individuals who you will be hearing from shortly. Joey Levy, our founder and chief executive officer. Jake Paul, our founder and president. Alex Ursa, our head of gaming. Mike Denevi, our head of media. Adrian Figueroa, our head of finance. Elizabeth Lodge, our brand, part, uh, brand strategy and partnership lead. Robert Warren, our compliance manager. And Victor Pires, our business operations lead. And don't worry, everyone will introduce themselves again when they, uh, when they speak. The following individuals will also be available if needed during the session. Chris Bevilacqua, the Chief Executive Officer of SimpleBet. Melissa Davis, the EVP Business Development and General Counsel of SimpleBet. And Michael Abramson, Outside Counsel. With that, we'll turn to our presentation. Victor, you're going to share the screen? Yes, no, 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 screen, HD meeting. Uh, <laughs> we, we need to yeah. quit and reopen it. So we have to jump back in. Okay, give us one second. Yeah, no problem whatsoever. And, and Mills, I know that you're there, and, and Dave, if they need any technical yeah. guidance. We don't evaluate based on this. I, it's always a challenge, it seems. There we go. Let's see if that worked. Okay. 
Commissioners, can you all see the presentation? We can, thank you. Great. So turning to slide two here, our agenda. We looked at the criteria set forth by the MGC in evaluating category three sports wagering operator license applicants and have prepared an agenda that we believe will address all the elements set forth by the MGC. First, we will provide an overview of better, including its gaming and media businesses. Next, we will introduce you to our founders and executive team and highlight their relevant exper expertise in this field. We will then provide an overview of our sports wagering platform, including its technical components. Following this, we will highlight our dedication and commitment to responsible gaming throughout all facets of our organization. We will then address the economic impact we expect better to have within the Commonwealth and highlight our contemplated Massachusetts focused initiatives, including working in conjunction with the Massachusetts lottery. Next, we will turn to our diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts, both from a workforce perspective, as well as a supplier spend perspective. We will then discuss in more detail our advertising and promotional plans in Massachusetts. Finally, we will conclude by discussing Better's licensing and compliance track record. One note I'd like to say as well, we are excited to share our product and vision with the general public. We have designated several sections of our application as confidential pursuant to Massachusetts public records laws. So if there are questions in those areas, uh, we will respectfully request to go into an executive session to further discuss such items with you. With that, I'll turn it over to our founder and CEO, Joey Levy, to kick off the presentation. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Ashwin. Hi, everyone. My, my name is Joey Levy. I'm the founder and CEO of Better. Uh, thank you so much for having myself and the team here today. We are grateful to be here to have the opportunity to receive the honor and privilege of receiving a sports wagering license in uh, the great state of, of Massachusetts. Uh, on this slide, you will find a, a high-level overview of the Better business, uh, where you will see we have two core businesses, gaming and media. Our gaming business is predominantly initially differentiated by a reimagined, simpler, and more intuitive user experience, as well as a focus on micro and in-play betting. Although, as you could see on the chart here, we also have a free-to-play business, a real money fantasy business, and an online casino business. On the media side, we are focused on original short form content uh, and the two core pillars of our strategy include premium franchises and always on social. Uh, despite launching our free to play app just about five months ago, we already have 100, over 120,000 downloads and multiple top app store ranking appearances. And despite also launching our media business a little bit over five months ago, we are the fastest growing sports betting media company in the country and are already the number two sports betting operator on social by, by uh, many measures. You could go to the next slide. So here you will find the, the Better team, a uh, little bit about my background prior to, to Better. I was the founder of SimpleBet, which is uh, the B2B technology company that leverages machine learning and real-time technology to uh, pioneer micro betting on U.S. sports, uh, and the company is currently licensing technology to, to companies like DraftKings, Caesars, Bet365, among others. Um, I've started this business with uh, Jake Paul, who, who's our founder and, and president. Uh, Jake is an entertainer and professional boxer who's headlined some of the highest grossing pay-per-view events in, in history. Uh, he's a top five global uh, creator and media mogul, and his social media presence alone is larger than many notable sports media companies, including you know Fox Sports, NBC Sports, and some of the household names that uh, we're all familiar with. Um, we're also on the executive team side, joined by Alex Ursa, who's our head of gaming. Uh, Alex is a product leader in the real money gaming industry with over eight years of industry experience. Uh, prior to Better, he spent seven years at Flutter across Betfair, Paddy Power, and most recently FanDuel, where he was part of the team that helped build FanDuel into the clear U.S. market leader as its senior uh, product director. Um, at FanDuel, Alex focused on launching new jurisdictions, new products, and was part of the leadership team that launched five online casino states and, and 14 online sportsbook states with a focus specifically on regulatory compliance, responsible gaming, and helping author their state-by-state -state go to market playbook. Also joined by Mike Denevi as our head of media. Uh, Mike spent the past 10 years at Bleacher Report where he worked his way up from, from being an intern all the way to, to founding and, and operating BR betting, which uh, quickly became the, the number one sports betting media brand on social in, in the United States. Also joined by Ashwin Krishnan, who's our head of legal and business affairs. 
uh, prior to better Ashman spent the prior 12 years with the Miami Marlins, where he gained extensive business and legal experience as their most recently as their general counsel, uh, playing an integral role during a period of rapid growth crisis and, and significant change. Um, and um, also joined on this call by, by Elizabeth Lodge, our brand partnerships lead, who, who has extensive experience in the sports media business, Adrian Figueroa, our head of finance, uh, Victor Pyrus, our bi business operations lead, and, and Robert Warren, our, our compliance manager. And uh, a common theme you'll notice with the team is that we, we all collectively have significant experience across sports media and entertainment, specifically with a proven track record across disruption and, and innovation. You could go to the next slide. So here you'll find a high level overview of our gaming business, as I've noted at the top and consistently throughout the application. We, we are initially focused on micro and in-play betting within our sports betting business, but we do have these other verticals within our gaming business. Uh, the, the initial one we launched was free to play, which we launched on September 1st of, of 2022. Um, we're currently live in, in all 50 states, excluding Washington and, and Nevada. Um, and we view free to play predominantly as a registration and onboarding platform mixed with an interactive tutorial for what's really a, a new and, and bespoke user experience around micro and in-play betting. On the sports betting side, um, as I've mentioned, initially focused on micro and in-play betting, but ultimately plan on offering uh, most forms of sports wagering over the long run. Uh, we actually launched our first uh, licensed product as a day one operator, January 1, 12.01 a.m. In, in Ohio. Um, and we're going to pursue a, a pretty gradual and methodical state by state rollout. Um, you know, we we uh, we've we've observed how some of the other sports betting operators have rolled out their their, their products and, and businesses. And as you can imagine, as a startup, we need to be very prudent and methodical with how we, we spend our cash. And we do think that we're one of the first, if not the first, to offer a fundamentally differentiated product experience in this category. And as a result of that, we want to take our time to really you know understand product market fit and make sure that we have a value proposition that is really resonating with consumers. Um, the current applications that we have outstanding are, as obviously noted here in Massachusetts, Virginia, Indiana, and Maryland. Um, so those will likely be um, the first five states, including Ohio, where we launch sports wagering, assuming we receive the honor and privilege of, of receiving a license in each of those jurisdictions. We also plan on launching a real money fantasy business, um, potentially as soon as later this quarter. We plan on launching that business in over 30 states. And we view this as a simple pre-match experience that complements our um, you know, predominantly in-play sports wagering experience, uh, while also you know, candidly enabling us to, to generate revenue uh, on a more nationwide basis in, in an interim period where, again, to support this uh, gradual and methodical state-by-state -state expansion for, for sports wagering, which, which has a, you know, a different set of costs uh, associated with it. Um, and finally, I'll, I'll note that we also plan on launching uh, online casino either in the back half of this year or in the first half of 2024. Um, and we're, we're in the very early stages of that and, and still sort of evaluating exactly how we're going to go to market with that with that experience. We we'll go to the next slide. All right, Mike, you want to take this one? Yeah, uh, I can Oh, yeah, sure. what's up, everyone? I'm I'm Jake Paul, um, known for being a uh, creator, boxer. Most recently, I paired both of these passions together into founding Better with Joey here. And uh, like Joey said, we have two branches, and the first being the product, which you just heard Joey speak about, and the second being a sports media company where we create original sports shows and videos with dozens of talent, including myself, Million Dollar Marco. Um, giving you a new way to view sports. Our goal at Better Media is to deliver new content that's easy to consume, that gives you the updates, makes you laugh, gives you the highlights, and that goes inside of your uh, the minds of your favorite athletes. Um, essentially, an honest take on the sports industry and fans' experience. And I am mostly grateful for the team around me at Better, uh, the advisory board, uh, you know, Joey, Denevi, uh, Liz, who will, 
you know, they'll speak here in a second, but they are high level business executives and professionals involved in this business and their track record speaks for themselves. We also have um, a talented and growing team of young professionals uh, on the media branch of our company. Everyone's like a super hard worker. Um, and it's what excites me the most about it. Uh, even Alex Ursa on the product side is, is a wizard and um, without a strong team, it wouldn't be possible to launch and be here with you today uh, alongside other legacy betting organizations. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, th I thank you guys the opportunity to present the better business to you today and we'll allow others on the media and product teams to walk you through our detailed approach and strategy to like how we look at uh, the media side of things and, and what we are doing and, and what we believe is effective and responsible. Um, so Mike, uh, yeah. Mike is the head Thanks, of- Thanks, Jake. Gotcha. Thanks, Jake. Uh, Mike Tenevi, head of media uh, at Better. Um, echo everything Jake said. Um, very uh, honored to, to be in front of y'all today and nice to meet you. Um, you know, for us as Jake echoed, we are, you know, on a mission here to grow this team to be, you know, the best in class. Uh, we've built out robust social production, original content, partnerships, growth, talent teams to really rise in, into being what you can see here in bold, uh, one of the top sports betting brands on digital and social in, in uh, five months since launch. You know, we've amassed close to a million followers across all of our platforms through the strategy of, you know, one, being always on on social. What does that mean? Uh, 365 topical reaction to the biggest stories in sports and sports betting, uh, original short form content, partnering with creators, you know, uh, locally, hopefully in, in Massachusetts and, and across the nation uh, to create kind of episodic short form content. Um, that we can, uh, you know, deliver to our audience in an organic way. And then lastly, as Jake mentioned, creating these premium franchises uh, in which, you know, we can start to kind of challenge traditional linear media um, and, and, you know, these with celebrities uh, to, to bring new perspective to, to a, a sports audience. So um, we'll get into a lot more of this throughout the slide, but I'll take it to Liz to introduce yourself as well. Hi everyone, Elizabeth Lodge, um, New England native, originally from Rhode Island. And so, uh, for me personally, uh, this is an honor to be considered uh, for Massachusetts for our second suite. Um, as Mike said, and Joey and Jake uh, mentioned as well, I am the brand strategy and partnerships lead for Better Media uh, and look forward to walking you through our overview and approach um, in the next coming minutes. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Um, so some quick notes on uh, the better sports wagering platform. So uh, as noted, uh, initially focused on enabling micro betting and eventually all forms of in-play sports betting while maintaining a, a strong focus on simplifying the, the sports betting user experience for, for a wider audience of casual sports fans. Our sports wagering platform uh, offers micro betting for, for three sports currently, basketball, baseball, and football across five leagues, NBA, NFL, MLB, college basketball, and college football. By automating all market mechanics, we ensure market creation, suspension, uh, resulting in repricing happen in milliseconds, which minimizes suspension time and, and ultimately enables a, a better user experience. And one core product differentiation that, that many in the industry aren't, aren't really talking about is this idea of bet delays. And, and we've actually eliminated bet delays uh, from the in-play betting uh, experience. Uh, so essentially uh, the delay between the customer placing a bet and when our system accepts the bet is, is nearly instantaneous as opposed to to the, the two to eight second buffer that, that you typically see with other sports wagering platforms. You could go to the next slide. And to, to summarize at a really high level, um, you know, ev everything we do it better from a product standpoint is really sort of delineated within these, these two core product tenants. One is simplifying the sports betting user experience. I, I actually got involved in this category because I remember when, uh, you know, I was initially interested in sports betting and I saw things like minus 175 money line plus five and a half point spread. I saw 49.50 oh slash U, which ultimately I later learned meant over under. Um, but I, I felt like those experiences were too complicating and, and intimidating for, for myself who had a fantasy sports background, if anybody should have 
have been able to intuitively pick up the, the experience. It should have been me. Um, but ultimately, I felt like the consumer experiences in this category left a lot to be desired if we're really going to use sports betting as a way to enhance the consumption of sport uh, as opposed to sort of a, a, a financially motivated, almost like spreadsheet transactional layer, which is what many of the, the, the legacy platforms looked and, and felt like at the time and still feel like, uh, to, to, to be frank. Um, so really focused on simplifying the, the experience. And if you see the, the spreadsheet or not the spreadsheet, the, uh, the screenshot on, on the right, you'll notice that the, the betting markets on, on better um, really displayed an, an intuitive multiple choice questions. We've gotten rid of traditional American odds like minus 175 and plus five and a half and added more intuitive pad multiples with the objective that anybody, any sports fan, even if they have not bet on sports before, should be able to pick up and intuitively interact with, with the product experience. And, and then, of course, the, the second core product tenant is the focus on micro and in-play betting. Um, you know, what one if you really zoom out and look at sort of the, the history of the sports betting uh, marketplace, the, the global marketplace, as, as you all know, has historically been driven by soccer, which, which is a fundamentally different sport than, than U.S. sports. Soccer is a fluid game without a lot of discrete occurrences, without a lot of scoring, uh, without a lot of moments to bet on. But if you think of the composition of U.S. sports, they feature a very stop and start cadence. There's a lot of scoring. There's a lot of speculation over superstar players and what they'll do next. So as a result of that, we think that micro and in-play betting may ultimately emerge as the predominant way to bet on sports in this country, but it requires a really dedicated product focus, which is why um, we're building, you know, essentially an entire company around it. Um, you could go to the next slide and, and here I'll hand it off to Alex to talk about the, the technical standards and features of the sports wagering platform. Hi everyone, my name is Alex Sousa. I'm head of Daily here at Better. I'm very honored to, uh, to be able to, to present uh, this for you today and also uh, very honored to be considered as a uh, licensed candidate for uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. We're gonna go through a few technical standards and features and then later uh, after the presentation, we, all, we will also do the, the product demo. As always, if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to, to answer them. So I think for us, the, the key point that we want to uh, point today is that we have taken a different uh, approach, as Joey said, and, and that's really uh, to ensure we simplify the, the customer experience. Uh, we create a secure environment, both from a, I would say, identity, money, and responsible uh, play perspective. I'm going to start with account registration. I think the biggest difference between us and other platforms is that, as you're going to see later, when someone is creating an account, we are also verifying their phone number on the spot at account creation. That allows us to make sure you know, a customer has access to, to their device and also uh, allows us to enforce two-factor authentication to, to make sure no one is able to uh, access the patient's account without their uh, knowledge. And also, when someone is creating an account, well, we are sending them an, a welcome email. Secondly, identity verification. We have best in class uh, identity verification with our pass rates uh, being significantly higher versus the industry. Our focus was really uh, on allowing customers to pass their identity verification in, in a simple way that's also compliant. We, are, we have thorough age uh, checks. You're gonna see again later, you're not gonna be able to actually select an age that if you're under uh, 21. Also very important versus other sports books. Better will never manually verify customers from the back office to eliminate human error risk or any kind of social engineering when someone can try to take or steal someone's identity. Then sec secure account access. Again, because we do that phone number verification at account creation, we are able to enforce two-factor authentication. So that means when a customer is using a new device or they come back after a long period of time, we will send them a code on their phone number, making sure that uh, the person who's logging in the account is actually the uh, account holder. Then moving forward to the enhanced deposit checks, uh, we have, this, is, this was one area of focus for us, making sure you know, funds are secure. And first of all, as we're gonna talk in the uh, responsible uh, gaming part, we do not allow credit cards in any US jurisdiction. Better is actually the first uh, U.S. operator to, uh, to not accept credit cards on their platform. Also, we have an advanced uh, address verification service. 
So when someone is using a debit card and they need to enter their address, we make sure the address they are entering matches the address that uh, is attached to that card. Again, making sure the person who has the card is, is using the card is also the owner. And of course, for all methods, we will do uh, name validation. Closed loop withdrawals, this is another key feature for us. This will allow a, a customer to withdraw funds only to a method that they use to fund the account. So I wouldn't be able to use, let's say, a debit card and then withdraw the funds to PayPal without making you know, a deposit with PayPal. Again, this will allow us to make sure uh, the patients are using the same methods uh, and helps us uh, steer away fraudulent and bad actors. Geolocation checks, as you know, this is the industry standard across all jurisdictions. Regulatory reporting, this is again one item that's very important for us. We would be able to uh, provide uh, the MGC access to comprehensive regulatory reporting, both on, on the financial uh, side and also on individual player activity. Responsible gambling, our core uh, focus would be responsible gambling. I am very passionate about responsible gambling. At my time at FanDuel and also at Better, I always uh, advocate responsible gambling. And we're gonna discuss more later, but we have all the industry uh, features plus some additions like uh, banning credit cards across all jurisdictions and introducing the concept of deposit limit, automatic deposit limits uh, for uh, customers between 21 and 25. And more importantly, again, we're gonna do that in the demo section. A user can set up wager or deposit limits as part of the onboarding process. So before they make any deposit or uh, place any bets, they have the option to set up a limit, which is again, something that uh, we are taking the leadership of. And then change management is, we're gonna, we're gonna be able to provide MGC clear uh, overview of how our platform is evolving, how our platform is license certified and what changes we're making, what kind of changes we're making. In terms of certification and approvals, we received our uh, mobile management service provider in uh, November from Ohio that allowed us to launch on January 1st uh, with other uh, operators. In terms of GLI, uh, certifications. We received individual GLI 33 certification letter for the betting engine and, and also for the player account management, but also we received the individual GLI certification letter for Ohio and for Virginia. Also, we have been uh, reviewing the Massachusetts regulations and working uh, with our partners, making sure we will be able to comply and receive a certification letter for Massachusetts if we get the privilege to be approved. Uh, for um, category three license. Joey, back to you. Thank you, Alex. Um, so we, we have a few slides here dedicated to our responsible gaming approach and I'll, I'll you know, just kick this off uh, really talking about our, our philosophy around responsible gaming, which was really informed by these two key points. So one being, um, you know, aside from responsible gaming with respect to, to every decision we make, at better, we, we believe we must exhibit a long-term mindset uh, if we're going to be the category defining business by the end of the decade, which we have every intention of, of ultimately becoming. Anything that potentially enables problem gambling will ultimately prove to be unsustainable and detrimental to the long-term viability of this category in general. Uh, and while it may bolster revenue today, it will increase customer turnover and introduce regulatory scrutiny tomorrow. The second point, uh, which which should you know be a seemingly obvious one um, is that you know we're not interested in acquiring users who are gambling with money that they do not have, uh, and we could not think of a clearer way to articulate this to the regulatory community, the industry, our employees, and and most importantly consumers themselves, uh, than by banning credit cards as a method of depositing uh, with respect to all of our real money gaming products. If we go to the next slide. Um, so just to sort of reiterate that that point last quarter, uh, we announced uh, that Better would be the first uh, regulated U.S. operator to proactively ban the use of credit cards as a method of, of depositing, uh, while also uh, uh, announcing that we will by default introduce wager and deposit limits for young betters aged uh, 21 to, to 25 years old. Could go to the next one, and I'll let uh, I'll let Mike talk about our, our responsible advertising strategy on, on the media side. 
Yeah. Hey, everyone. Mike and Emmy again. Um, yeah, on the media side and the advertising side, this is top priority for us. Uh, you really can't go to anywhere uh, at better on digital and not see overt, explicit, responsible gambling messaging in terms of end cards, caption call outs, lower thirds, um, threaded messages. Uh, we're also creating bespoke content. Uh, as you know, our, our organic strategy is to create original content at a very high volume. With that, obviously, it needs to be responsible gambling content as well. And we take that very seriously. And for us, it's like we can't just be checking boxes here. We, we can't just be saying, you know, we need to do this in our bio and we're fine. We're thinking about this every day on how we can be as explicit as possible to make sure that this is featured uh, across all of our content. Um, you know, and that includes, you know, 21 plus, which is obviously a huge priority. And we're not featuring marketing targeting anybody underage, uh, including the 1-800 problem, the other hotline uh, for those that need help everywhere. Um, and, and, you know, as Joe you know, mentioned, very important to us that people aren't gambling more uh, or with what they don't have in, in messaging, messaging that across. Uh, we launched in Ohio, obviously, a few weeks ago. Um, and, you know, you can see on the right, there have been numerous call-outs and praise for our efforts here across press and, and industry. And we're going to continue to work very closely with the OCC um, and, and, you know, really make sure we're as transparent as possible and continuing to be uh, innovative in this category to make sure uh, we're, we're being in the industry. Yeah, Alex Ursa back. Uh, we're we're going to talk a bit about the, the uh, player uh, self-service control. So first of all, deposit limits, uh, we allow players to set a limit uh, that they want to deposit, you know, daily, weekly, monthly, and we said, you know, deposit and, and wager. Uh, limits will uh, be by default for age between 21 and 25. Wager limits, again, uh, you've maybe already seen this with other providers, but this allows a, a pay, patient to uh, set a specific amount that they want to wager uh, daily, weekly, and monthly, or also maximum single bets. So if someone doesn't want to bet more than $20 on, on any given bet, they can set that. In terms of time limits, uh, you can set up a specific uh, amount of hours that you want to use, uh, you'll be able to use the, our app every day. Then in terms of reality check, we have this on by default, gives customers a notification every 15 minutes to uh, the length of time they play and the amount of money they, they wager during this time. Cool off periods, functions like a short set of exclusion from the app and we, uh, with a range from three days to 365. And then self-exclusion uh, is an extended break or block from the app between with periods of one, three, five, and lifetime. Also, we are already uh, ingesting a uh, response uh, self-excluded uh, list from Ohio, and uh, we pro process that once an hour. Even if the, the requirement is to do it once a week, we proce process that once an hour. If, if a patient that's on that list uh, tries to create an account with us, we are blocking them, or if they create an account in the last hour, we're gonna uh, also block them. We'd we'll be more than happy to uh, ingest a similar uh, list uh, from uh, MGC. And also we would be more than happy to, uh, if needed to open our list towards the uh, gaming commission if they wanna uh, share that with other operators. Yes, uh, also once a cool off or a self-exclusion period is set, the patient is not allowed to decrease the time uh, and at any point they can contact us to extend the duration of the time period and that will uh, take effect immediately. Robert. Good morning. Um, good morning, distinguished members of the commission. Uh, good morning team. My name is Robert Warren and I have the uh, honor of being the compliance manager here at Better. My background is in regulatory compliance I'm a former gaming regulator from two jurisdictions. I served as a casino compliance rep for the Maryland Lottery and Gaming Control Agency. And I was the investigations and enforcement agent for the Office of Lottery and Gaming in the District of Columbia before beginning my journey here at Better. Basically, I'm the whip. Um, Better is dedicated to providing the highest standard of customer care. Uh, this has been built into our company culture as well as our sports gaming operations where responsible gaming is a top priority for all personnel as illustrated earlier by my colleagues. Our responsible gaming plan provides the framework from which better will ensure its practices are consistent with the community's expectations 
and that the sports wagering operation will be conducted in a responsible manner. Better will take all the necessary steps to, pro to promote responsible gambling on its sports wagering platform, as well as enforce all regulations pertaining to responsible gaming to include prohibited patron enforcement. Better requires all individuals to acknowledge and confirm their status as an additional step in preventing prohibited persons, restricted patrons, and participants of the voluntary self-exclusion program as outlined in Title 205, uh, Code of Massachusetts Regulation 233 from creating an active sports wagering account. A player account will automatically be blocked if the first name, last name, date of birth, and social security number in the better database all match that of a prohibited person on the Massachusetts database. Better will review any fuzzy matches where not all but some of the identifiers match a prohibited person and take the appropriate steps um, if there's a match on the prohibited list for Massachusetts as well. With respect to underage enforcement, Better makes diligent and persistent efforts to prevent underage individuals from gambling. All applications offered by Better will require users to be at least 21 years of age. Better communicates to the public the legal age to gamble through advertising and marketing outreach material and via Better's player protection page. Of course, Better will adhere to all requirements of Title 205, Code of Massachusetts Regulation 250, referencing the protection of minors and underage youth from sports wagering. Better monitors our patrons and their gaming patterns to identify signs or triggers of problem gambling, assessing and addressing situations where a player indicates they are in distress or experiencing problems. Better is working with responsible gaming advisors and consultants to implement a rigorous responsible gaming platform across our product, media, and business operations. Better recently met with Marlene Warner and Chelsea Turner at the Massachusetts Council on, Game, um, on Gaming and Health. Um, I'm sure this is nothing new to you, but I believe that it's absolutely worth mentioning that the Massachusetts Council on Gaming and Health has been at what we would consider the forefront of RG research. Better is looking forward to further discussions with them on incorporating the Game Sense framework to include the Game Sense advisors into our responsible gaming program and other areas that they can provide assistance in as we continue to make good on our pledge to improve our overall RG culture. We also met with Mr. Keith White from the National Council on Problem Gambling. In that meeting, we discussed the abundance of opportunities that we are looking forward to pursuing in collaboration with the MCPG. Some of those opportunities include live employee training, RG policy and advisement services, brand placement, and ICAP certification. And for clarification, ICAP is the Internet Compliance Assessment Program um, based on the Internet Responsible Gaming Standards devised by a panel of gambling harm prevention experts from around the world. I think it's worth noting as well that in that meeting, it was stated that the NCPG was looking forward to working with Better in hopes to create a disruptive and innovative RG program that we, and also in hopes that we could provide much more value than the legacy operators have historically been willing to. And last but not least, Better is working with iGaming Academy to ensure all full-time employees and key contractors complete required training on topics such as anti-bribery, uh, code of conduct, equality and diversity, responsible gaming, sexual harassment, and online sports book. We require all new hires to complete this mandatory training. We also require mandatory refresher courses for all employees and key contractors. Again, I wanna thank you for allowing me time to present. I would now like to pass that baton back to my colleague, the head of business and legal and business affairs, uh, Mr. Ashwin Kirschman. Ashwin Kirschman again. Wanna just, in addition to everything mentioned by Joey, uh, Alex, Mike and Robert, uh, note that Better is also proactively determined to form a compliance committee to add an additional layer of accountability to our sports wagering operations. We've secured the tentative commitment of three highly respected individuals to provide independent oversight of our operations. A.G. Burnett, the former chairman of the Nevada Gaming Control Board, Mark Dunn, former general counsel of Aristocrat, and Sarah Tate, former executive director of the Indiana Gaming Commission. The compliance committee's specific scope and functions will be guided by the knowledge and experience of its members. 
Hi, Adrian Figueroa, Head of Finance. Thank you all for meeting with us today. Um, in terms of the economic impact of the business, uh, Better is uniquely positioned to expand the addressable market for sports betting in the Commonwealth, and therefore the revenue opportunity for the Commonwealth, given our unique business model and positioning, which can be highlighted in three key areas. So the first being an intuitive interface and experience that caters to the casual sports fans. So as Joey has alluded to earlier in the presentation, the way that typical sports books display odds um, it simply adds a lot of friction to the experience and is intimidating um, since the casual sports fan doesn't know how to, how to interpret uh, minus 350 money line, minus five and a half spread, minus 110, et cetera. And so if you look, there, there's a massive delta between the number of sports fans in the U.S., um, even in the states where sports betting is already legal, and the number of active sports bettors in the country and we believe that the key reason for this massive discrepancy and why the market is so underpenetrated is because the casual sports fan uh, just doesn't understand a lot of the terminology and it's not really catered to them. And so our interface, as you can sort of see on the right here, is extremely intuitive to where the average sports fan can pick it up and immediately understand the product and know how to use it. Uh, the second pillar to this is our primary focus on micro and live betting. Uh, so we view this as an ancillary segment of the market that really expands uh, the addressable market, um, whereas other operators may be focused on the same match outcome-based odds. Better uh, wants to become synonymous with live and in-play betting, um, which really just expands the entire pie of the sports betting market and offers users more choice. Uh, lastly, uh, as we alluded to several times, is our marketing and brand awareness strategy, given our media content uh, side of the business, um, you know, led by Jake Paul and his 70 million uh, followers across social media and betters uh, almost a million me uh, social media followers that we've gained in just a few months um, since launch. Um, we've developed a really strong way to acquire users, some of which, uh, again, were not really hardcore sports fans or super into sports betting to begin with. And we've gotten a lot of great feedback from a lot of users that are using the app um, who have actually never bet on sports before. Uh, so when you tie all of these three pillars together, we're really uniquely positioned uh, to expand the market and attract, uh, you know, maybe more casual sports fans that were not otherwise going to be uh, active sports betting users on other platforms. Yeah, so in terms of uh, the Massachusetts Focus initiatives, um, as you all know, Better is a Miami-based business today uh, with just one office located in Miami, Florida. Uh, but we have much broader ambitions to become a national company with a localized presence across the country. Um, if we are fortunate enough to be granted a license in Massachusetts, uh, this will certainly be a key market for us. And we plan on hiring for in-person marketing, media production, product, and business operations in the Commonwealth. Um, Massachusetts is an extremely important market for us uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first being a little more obvious and just how uh, big and important of a sports market Massachusetts is. Um, obviously a lot of the, the most iconic sports brands um, across all of sports reside in Massachusetts. And this really lends itself well to our media and content side of the business, which there's a lot of opportunity um, to have you know, an in-person presence there and, and something that, that uh, would really play to our strengths. Um, secondly, is that, you know, if we were fortunate enough to be granted uh, the license in Massachusetts, um, this would be one of our first uh, two states that, that were launched in. And so this is a, a long-term relationship that we want to develop. Um, and, and it's in a really important market for us. And as a result, uh, Massachusetts is a strong candidate for a satellite office uh, down the road. And we're really, really excited about seeing um, a strong local presence in Massachusetts. And I'll pass it off to uh, Liz and Mike to cover the rest of our local cool. initiative. Yeah, would also would also love to bring uh, Boxing Bullies Gym to somewhere in Massachusetts. I know Boston's a, a big uh, a big fight capital, but Boxing Bullies is uh, my foundation where we're focused on instilling leadership, courage, um, and, and you know. And, and just hard work through the youth, through the sport of boxing while fighting back against bullying. We've opened up uh, 
five gyms uh, in the past 18 months, given over 500 pairs of gloves to kids held workouts. Um, and so it's a really good initiative for the community and boxing is growing. It's like the third fastest growing uh, sport now. Um, so it would be awesome to, to get involved somehow with boxing bullies in, in the local Boston area or really wherever uh, we would like to work with you guys to figure out, you know, where would be best within Massachusetts. Yes, and hi, uh, Elizabeth Lodge again. Um, just to speak specifically to what I think the opportunity is from the media side, as well as going live um, product launches, that within our physical footprint, um, if we are to engage locally on the ground as we did in Ohio, we'd look to take over uh, certain restaurants, um, bars, activations, and within that physical footprint, of course, we wanna ensure that we aren't creating aspirations around the functionality and use of betting for anyone underage. So all of those bars and restaurants and locations similar to Ohio would all be 21 plus. And furthermore, we're steadfast against you know, kind of creating an environment within, uh, you know, local activations that supports and encourages uh, small businesses. So looking to create, um, and while Adrian said, you know, we don't have an office um, or a physical location in Massachusetts quite yet, um, but I think as a step one into the investment, you know, we've been very mindful of hires and expenditures until we grow, but a part of that growth will be having um, you know, action video and different media um, activations that require localized staff upwards of four to 20 people uh, per production shoot. And that's not inclusive of um, talent drivers, ambassadors, and others that we hope to engage locally within Massachusetts and the Commonwealth. And Ashra. Yep, and just to touch again on community involvement, Jake covered the Boxing Bullies uh, initiative, which we'd like to bring to Massachusetts, but we'd also like to uh, work with other charities and nonprofit organizations, particularly those focused on workforce development for communities that suffer from high unemployment, underemployment within the Commonwealth. Um, we Examples of organizations that better intend to explore partnerships with are YMCA's, Boys and Girls Club, and uh, a particular nonprofit called the Actionary Institute that focus on uh, the Haitian American community, which is both prevalent here in the Miami area and also in the Boston area. So that was of interest to us. We're also looking to partner with local colleges and universities to provide professional development, career guidance, coaching, uh, internships, and shadowing opportunities. We've already had discussions with Harvard Law School and the UMass Eisenberg School of Management on what these partnerships might look like. What's up, guys? Mike Denevi, head of media again. Um, just building off of what Liz was, was just saying in terms of you know how we're connecting with the audience on the ground in Massachusetts. You know, our our whole goal look behind creating this organic first content strategy is we want to form deeper connections with our users, other than just pass by commercials or traditional advertising. And that same strategy carries over to what we want to do on the ground as we connect with audience and, and the people of Massachusetts. Um, so you know, going to the games sending any list talent to a Red Sox game or going to the tailgates, having watch parties at bars um, and really being as inclusive as possible with the entire state. Um, and then extending that to, to content and, and also partnering with a lot of the local businesses as Liz has already been working on uh, in Ohio. And we've seen some great success in that case study, but obviously we've done that in Massachusetts as well. On, on the lottery side, um, you know, we're very committed to cross-marketing um, the lottery to help increase ticket sales there. Uh, we see the Massachusetts lottery as something that we can really help amplify through that content strategy that I was just talking about. Um, you know, getting uh, A-list talent to engage with the lottery um, and, and creating that content around it and showing, you know, the participation, the fun you can have in doing it, obviously all responsibly. Um, so, you know, that would be kind of step one. And I think step two is really interesting where we can you know, use this creative collaboration that we have internally at Better uh, to partner and collaborate to create cross-promotional opportunities. Uh, one example of this is something we created at Better was a free-to-play game called Better Ticket where you had to you know, guess, if you will, how many yards will a quarterback have, a running back have, will a wide receiver have, and you kind of get this long number, much like a lottery ticket, and, and there was a prize and we saw great success uh, and getting people to use that, download the app, and engage with that. And I do think there, you know, that could be one example. But I think there's tons of really collaborative and creative ideas that we can help amplify the lottery and, and obviously drive uh, awareness and, and sales to it. 
So turning to diversity, equity, and inclusion, Better is a champion of diversity, equity, inclusion efforts across its investor group, leadership team, and broader organization. We've successfully obtained racial, ethnic, and gender minorities within our investor group, which is seen in our application. Two of our board members are racial minorities, and across our 14-person leadership team, we have six, uh, six individuals that identify as minorities, including our head of engineering, head of finance, uh, head of legal business affairs, head of product customer, brand strategy and partnerships lead, and business operations lead. Um, in terms of statistics across our entire organization, more than 55% of our full-time employees are racial, ethnic, or gender minorities. Uh, breaking that down a little further, 41% identify as racial, ethnic minorities, and 19% identify as gender minorities. Uh, better will continue to find talent across underrepresented groups in the sports betting and the sports media industries. We also look forward to the findings of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission on minority business participation in the sports wagering industry in Massachusetts, which will help guide our efforts and grow the inclusion and participation of women, minorities, and veteran businesses in this nascent industry. We're eager to work with these under, underserved communities to provide vocational training, professional development, internships, real life work experience, and financial support. Examples of organizations with whom better envision partnership opportunities with surrounding race, equity, and inclusion within the Massachusetts economic and workforce landscape include the Massachusetts Lottery, who you just heard about. We recognize the lottery as an essential source of local aid for communities in Massachusetts, so we're very eager to work on cross-promotional campaigns and marketing collaborations to not only not take away revenue from the lottery, but actually enhance and increase its, its effect on local communities. Additionally, we, we're interested in working with the Urban League of Mass Eastern Massachusetts, the Black Economic Council of Massachusetts, and the NAACP Boston branch. We'd love to be part of these organizations to better understand how better and the sports waging industry as a whole can contribute to the workforce development of minority communities in Massachusetts. Additionally, we'd like to, we, we'd like to work with the Women in the Enterprise of Science and Technology to ensure that women are included at all levels of the workforce as the sports wagering industry takes shape in Massachusetts. We'd also like to join and participate in the Massachusetts Nonprofit Network, the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce, and the Massachusetts High Technology Council as part of our larger efforts to inform the development of our own workforce policies and programs in the areas of diversity, equity, and inclusion. An ongoing priority for us has been creating an internal supplier diversity policy handbook that includes relevant DEI educational material and outlines our DEI-focused goals. The initial high level principles that we envision serving as guideposts for our supplier DEI efforts are as follows. Clearly identifying the categories that count towards our diverse supplier spend, which were taken from the, uh, from the SBA. So small businesses, women owned business enterprises, minority owned business enterprises, veteran owned business enterprises, service disabled business enterprises, SBA, SBA eight business enterprises, hub zone business enterprises, and LGBT business enterprises. We are committed to having 30% of our supplier and vendor spend come from diverse suppliers by 2024 in accordance with the aforementioned categories. We also want to ensure that better employees, especially those in decision-making positions with respect to vendors, understand the importance of investing in supplier diversity. And finally, we want to elevate our relationships with our vendors, particularly the ones we view as pioneers in the DEI space to more than just transactional relationships. Better has created a DEI survey for our vendors to ensure that our organization is accurately monitoring our supplier ecosystem and tracking towards our spend commitments. The initial survey insights show nearly 1 million of spend with vendors that identify as each of Hispanic American, African American, and Asian Pacific American, as well as more than 100,000 worth of spend with vendors that identify as each of Alaska Native and Native American. Hey guys, Mike again. Um... In terms of our advertising promotional plans, obviously we want to utilize uh, this audience we've already built and we'll continue to grow on digital. Um, you can see that social all our growth over time and kind of the unprecedented rise we've had in capturing audience uh, on digital and, and obviously this organic short form video strategy uh, built around A-list talent and up and coming content creators is something we'll continue to lean in on, uh, especially in Massachusetts. Um, so at the end of the day, you know, I mentioned this, but really building this brand awareness through this organic campaign, uh, while at the end of the day, we think we'll build brand affinity as well, um, that, that will really lead to uh, users and, and growth on the product side. Um, what does that mean for, for Massachusetts? You know, we, we've stated a uh, $3 million estimated uh, promotional and advertising plan in year one. How would we get there? Obviously, through these organic content initiatives, which would, you know, be Jake going to Boston and watching a game, other A-list talent, interviewing Boston legends, going to the bars, doing live shows, 
um, really investing in, in this content production and the people around it. I think Elizabeth mentioned earlier, but investing in these content, these local content creators, production and staffers as we build out that media hub uh, within uh, Massachusetts. Um, obviously to custom bonuses and campaigns, working with Alex and the product team and our growth teams uh, to think of, you know, differentiated ways in which we can, can capture audience and, and uh, get them in uh, through these bonuses. And then lastly, working with Elizabeth on partnerships with local sports teams or businesses, as she mentioned earlier as well. Um, you go to the next slide. Through all of this, um, as we mentioned constantly, it will all be done through, uh, you know, responsible gambling being top of mind and first and foremost in everything that we do in content creation, production, advertising, and promotional planning. Ashwin Krishna again, we wanted to conclude our presentation by referring back to our su successful efforts to get licensed by the Ohio Casino Control Commission and receive approval to launch at their universal start date of January 1st, 2023. We've really enjoyed the open and transparent relationship we've had with the OCC staff and have appreciated their questions and feedback every step of the way from our initial application, navigating the licensing process, discussing our ideas for responsible gaming related initiatives, previewing consumer communications and marketing materials with them, and ultimately receiving the license and their approval. We hope to have a similar relationship with the MGC as we've found such collaboration and close communication to be extremely useful for both operators and regulators alike. I'll just note that in addition to Better receiving an entity, entity level license from the OCCC, key individuals from Better, including Joey Levy, Jake Paul, Alex Ursa, Mike Denevi, Adrian Figueroa, and myself, were also individually licensed by the OCCC. And through their previous employers, Joey and Alex have, were licensed in several other jurisdictions. As we stated in our application, neither Better nor any of its key persons have ever had any gaming related license denied, suspended, revoked, or non renewed or have ever been found unsuitable in any jurisdiction. I'll turn it over to Joey now to conclude our presentation. Sorry, it was on mute. Appreciate it, Ashwin. Um, in addition to getting licensed in Ohio, uh, as you can see here, we have already been praised for our responsible gaming efforts and uh, look forward uh, to the potential honor and privilege of receiving a gaming license in Massachusetts where uh, we would plan on continuing our, our leadership uh, position in responsible gaming and uh, welcome any dialogue with, with you all um, over the course of, of, of um, you know, potentially receiving this license and going live um, as, uh, as we're eager to uh, continue this leadership position on the responsible gaming front. As noted earlier, uh, seeing this as a, as a critical uh, initiative for us to, to preserve the long-term viability of the industry and ultimately enable consumers to uh, engage with sports wagering in, in the way that it, it should be intended to, which is to enhance the consumption of, of sports. Um, so with that, we'll, we'll conclude the presentation uh, and really appreciate you all providing us the opportunity to, to tell you more about our business and, um, and, uh, and, and appreciate it. Thank you. So we'll uh, go to the to the demo next. We need just a couple of minutes to like to set up because uh, we want to make sure everything works fine. Yeah, just so everyone can hear, we we're turning to our product demo and uh, just getting a couple of minutes to set up. That's fine. Take. I was looking forward to it.
I will join the meeting from my phone. And then we'll do a screen share of his phone. So I need to do that right now. Can you all see the screen? We can. Perfect. So we will do. Uh, we will go through all the journey. We're gonna start with the sign up. Uh, we will use uh, for the sign up verification process initially like some random information. And in executive session, we will are more than happy to also show you successful flow because we will need to use a real personal uh, information to be able to pass the KYC flow. So we're gonna. Uh, not pass KYC in the public sector if that's okay, because we will need to use someone's SSL. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna use actually our, our test field, uh, which uh, we, we have shared with GLI for testing uh, purposes. And Mike, I'm gonna use your phone number if it's okay when we, we're gonna sign up. So we're gonna sign up, email, let's call it Alex Ursa. And you can see test better app. Uh, as you can see, we're giving uh, patients uh, information about how they can set up a, a strong password. So we need to have one letter, one number, one special character, and at least eight minimum characters. After this, I need to enter my phone number. Mike, it's 408 315 nine eight nine five this will be a check hopefully you didn't use your, your phone number but we need to be unique so you cannot create two accounts with the same phone number uh, you should receive uh, a code right now usually you would auto populate seven four seven four nine nine one seven as you can see uh, users can also have face ID uh, on if they want to re-authenticate uh, when that session expires. We're going to press next. And also you can see we have two-factor authentication on by default. So that means when a user signs up, uh, we will uh, uh, enforce that. They have the ability to disable, but we're open if, if the commission feels like we're open to enforce this and not allow customers to disable it again. But for now, we allow customers the option to disable. At this point, the account has been created, but my identity hasn't been verified. The next step would be to verify my identity. So I'm gonna start uh, the identity process and we're gonna start with the last four digits of the SSN. Again, this will not be a successful path because we cannot use real information while uh, streaming. Use this. I'm gonna use my real name. As you can see, if I try to use an age that's below 21, I'm not able to pass this specific test. It is giving me information that, you know, I need to be under, uh, above 21. And if I would be under 21 and I would try to use a birthday that's above 21, I would be failed because we are enforcing strict age verification with exact match for uh, year of birth, month of birth, and date of birth. So we're gonna use uh, a date in the future, in the past, sorry. Then the next step would be to add my an address, let's say 402. It's street Miami, Florida. If you want to set up. Also, we are doing a cross reference between state and zip and city. So if someone would use like a zip that's not associated to that state or to that city, we would fail them as an invalid 
uh, information. Next step, basically, I, I can review the information I, I entered and if I need to make any edits, I'm able to do uh, any edits. And I have the acknowledgement screens which I need to read and acknowledge. And then at this point, once I press continue, the age verification, sorry, the identity and age verification is happening. It's instant, instant. Uh, I failed because I used uh, wrong information. And I could try again, but now I would enter the full social security, not just uh, the last four. I could review or edit any information that I previously entered. Be happy, I'm happy. And I would need to acknowledge again, and uh, I could pass again. We're going to do the, the pass in executive session if you would like, so you can see also how you can set up a deposit limit and a wager limit once you pass uh, verification. Um, now, if could I just pause for one minute because I think I'm hearing that you like to uh, do a part, part of your demonstration, a portion of it in executive session. I just want to get clearance with our council that he understands okay. that, that everyone has, you know, an understanding of expectations. Yes, and just to clar clarify your request, it's because we're going to use an actual social security number. So for privacy reasons, we'd like to use, do that portion in the executive session. But that's the only portion we would uh, review, basically. Everything else we would continue to do right now, we, we have a verifying account that's ready to go for all the flows. So it's just a demonstration of the security numbers? Is that what I heard? I'm sorry. Yeah, the social security number of an actual social security number, correct. Okay. We can decide if that's uh, an important element. Of, I'm so sorry, uh, an element of the demonstration. I just wanted to make sure that that was the only piece. Uh, yeah. So we can continue the demonstration. I just wanted to make sure we were aligned. Yeah, that's the only piece again, because we will use uh, Aspen's uh, personal information and we wouldn't want that uh, stream. I'm so sorry that you took down the demonstration. My apologies. No, it's, I, I will log out now and I will use a, an account that I verified in advance. So we could, let's say, uh, pretend that the previous account has passed verification and this would be uh, Shared experience once they they pass that step. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, I have a question about the piece of the demonstration we just saw. Yes, Mr. Ursa, am I correct in understanding that an individual twenty one and under can create an account before so, okay. before the verification, the KYC verification is is applied. So uh, once they will fail, basically, they will be blocked if they try to create for two reasons. One, they cannot select an age under 21. So they don't have that option to select an age under 21. And if they lie about their age, we are doing age verification. So that means uh, when, let's say, I'm 20 uh, years old and 11 months and five days and I use, you know, I, I put a, like, 22 as, uh, as my age. So I use the same month and they will change the year or I change the month. I will fail because the date of birth needs to match exactly the public record. So there's no way for a, uh, a user under 21 to be able to verify deposit or wager. Yes, but you're not getting the age prompt until after you've created an account. And, and so, just before the, the KYC, check is, yeah, so, uh, is that correct? Uh, correct and that's uh in line with uh i would say uh what we have been seeing in the in industry we're more than happy to uh make the flow continuously if that's something uh the commission is looking for uh definitely we, we don't see a, a downside of that what would be the utility of a person 21 years uh, of age or, or under to hold a, a better account there's no utility in that. All right, and I understand you just said you'd be willing to adjust those practices uh, should a license be granted for Massachusetts. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I didn't realize I wasn't sharing my screen anymore, so I would go back and I will use an account that has been uh, verified. Oh, 
I need to look in enough to create that account. And I was saying 21 and under, but 21 is the legal age to gamble. So under 21, just making that correction. But I think it was understood. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So at this point, I have to pack that authentication on. I would need to enter the code. So that means I need to have my phone with me when I use my platform. Uh, and now basically I am in the password. What we're gonna go, I have a list of flows that we're gonna go through together. We're gonna start with uh, a deposit. I can make a deposit uh, with a debit, debit card. I have a few debit cards that are already saved. As you can see, a lot of them uh, for testing purposes. And by the time we will launch in Massachusetts, we expect to have also online banking and uh, PayPal ready for, uh, for users. So we will have three methods uh, that will, uh, will be available. Then the next flow would be, I could go now that I made a deposit and see my transaction history. So I can go and see all the trans financial transactions. So deposits, withdrawals, adjustment or bonus uh, award that I can see in my, in my transaction history with information about the day, the hour, the amount, the transaction ID, and the type of transaction. Then what we could do is we could uh, scroll through our three uh, leagues that we, we have right now. So first one is NFL. On top of the screen, you have the live visualizer. So this is like, these are the games that we are now, uh, these are in place that are in our test environment. So we can uh, demonstrate the live betting. So in, on top of the screen, we have real time data visualization of the game, basically all the events of the game. We can also hide it if we want, or if uh, we can also open into a text mode where someone can uh, follow the game just uh, on a play-by-play -play basis as you would see on, on ESPN, for example. The next, then we have two types of, of markets, team players, and for NFL, we also have player props. Uh, in terms of uh, team, mark, uh, team available markets, you, you could bet on the drive result. What would uh, the Titans do with this drive, which is the second drive of the game? Score a touchdown, have a punt, a turnover, or a field goal. I could say this is going to be a touchdown, and I'm going to bet $5 on, on this. As you can see, there's no bet delay. There's no spinning wheel. Uh, we, if the market is available, that we allow the customer to, to bet that amount. Then I could go to the next market if I want to have a different bet and say, will the Titan score this drive, score, no score? And again, I could say score $5. As Joey uh, showed uh, and presented earlier, our markets are question-based. So a sports fan can bet without needing to go and read about what a money line is or what a point spread is. Other examples uh, that we could have is what player would, would score a, a touchdown uh, this drive. You know, I could choose a player here. And then I can go and see my bets. So my bets basically shows me my active bets, bets that I just placed and are not settled. And I can see the information about the, the bet, the market, the team, the wager, the multiplier, the potential payout, the event, and the score right now. And I can expand also and get more information about the bets, like the unique bet ID, and then unique uh, bet identifier, and also the day and the hour when the bet was placed. If I go to the settled bets, which are bets that I placed, let's say yesterday and are already settled, I could go and see this, the same information, but I could see the result. Like I had a bet that the Titans will, uh, I said that there will be a punt that drive, but actually it was a turnover. So my bet was a loss. And then I have, uh, I had another bet, which was a winning one. Uh, when I said that uh, Cincinnati will not score a touchdown and I was right. So I can see that the uh, bet was a winning one, shows the uh, payout, shows the final score, and also the same information of uh, the game info, 
bet ID, market ID, when the bet was placed and when the bet was sent. In case the customer has any, any questions, we are able to identify those bets uh, based on those identifiers. So this is the, like, the NFL experience. Before I go to NBA, do you have any questions about this one? I do have a question, Chair. Sure. Thank you, Krishna. Um, under what circumstances does the multiplier change? So uh, as Joey said, our markets, uh, most of the markets are uh, automated by trading algorithms as they would be with any other uh, market on any other sports book. Uh, so if something changes, for example, you have uh, drive result, you know, touchdown, punt, turnover, field goal. This is really dependent on what's happening in the game. So for example, you have these, these odds, but if the Titans will advance and we'd be closer to scoring a touchdown, that means that the probability of having a touchdown is, is higher, so those odds will change. And if the odds are changing while you try to place a bet, we notify you that there's a change and you need to accept before you can bet that the odds have changed. Thank you. Okay, I will go next to NBA. So NBA, uh, again, has two types of markets, team markets and player markets. Team markets is we have possession results for like you that you that just what would be the result? Would be a two-pointer, three-pointer, free throws, turnover, or a missed uh, field goal. And then uh, for players, player props, we have uh, just what type of uh, field goal uh, point will the player make, a two-pointer or a three-pointer. Very important for our college offering, which is right now just college football, and we, we aim to bring college basketball in time for March Madness. We have just team uh, drive and play. We do not offer college player props. So you cannot bet on a college game on how many uh, points, sorry, how many uh, yards a, a pass will be or how many yards a player will carry. So it's just only team specific uh, bets. Going uh, further, what I want to show you is our account screen. You could see your balance, your bonus, deposit withdrawal. Uh, you have access to the house rules if you want to access them. We have uh, access to the responsible gaming. We have access to the features roadmap. We, have visit we give customers the ability to see what features we're bringing in the future. So we're always proactive about what uh, what we've seen. And you can see now the reality check because I've been using the app for uh, 15 minutes. It tells me I've been using it for 15 minutes and I wagered uh, $20 during this time. I can also access the terms and conditions of the app right away. And also I can uh, delete my account, see my personal information on or turn off or turn on to back out the notification. The most important feature that I, I think we should demo here is the responsible gambling section. So we have a section dedicated for responsible gambling where we show the tools that the customers are able to set and also additional resources. These resources today are Ohio specific mostly, but we will incorporate the uh, Massachusetts ones if we get a privilege to, to get the, the license and operate in Massachusetts. Again, we are open to provide more information if uh, MGC has specific requirements about uh, food, like if they want to show a specific message, video, and explanation. In terms of the tools, uh, I think you already seen all these tools uh, during uh, the presentation, but we offer deposit limits where you could set up a, a weekly or a deposit limit. And again, the same rules apply. If I decrease the limit, it will apply right away. If I increase it, uh, it will need to go through a cool off period before I can confirm the changes. Wager limits, again, how much I can bet during a day, a week, or a month. Uh, I already have, uh, let's put this. Thousand. This has applied right away because I decreased it and I made, made it more strict. Mr. Ursa, would you mind going back to the deposit limits, please? Yes. Um, 
Uh, I applaud um, better on the, uh, the innovation of the deposit limits for the 21 to 25 year old cohort. Um, can you show that? I'm wondering, I understand it's a default. Can that be overridden by the player? Right now, we do not allow that, but we actually, we have scheduled the work to allow players to, uh, you know, if they want to remove it, remove it. But right now, uh, that's uh, an enforced uh, limit that we are uh, looking to uh, allow customers to change it. But again, we are open here for recommendations. Like if, if, if MGC uh, believes that we should not allow until the age of 25 is passed, for the customer to remove that limit, we, we could look into that. And so in Ohio, uh, if I were a 21 year old playing? Um, if you're 20, you will not be able to play. Uh, I hope that was a test that I passed it. Uh, but if you're like 22, you create an account, you have a deposit limit in four that you cannot edit. But that would be for all jurisdictions, all products, not just Ohio. But if the commission feels that they we shouldn't do this, like we would definitely, we will need to do a bit of work on our side to cater for like, let's say not in, impose those limits in Massachusetts, but we we would do that if that's preferred. But right now we believe that, you know, from an RG perspective, uh, we want to introduce that across all products in all jurisdictions. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think my screen, I need to reshare it. Sorry again. Oh, really good questions. Then uh, I can, as I said, I can have a max uh, bet with single wager. So basically, if I set this limit, let's see, if I put it to uh, 65, I'm not going to be able to bet on, on more than 65 in, in one bet. Next one, cool off and self-exclusion. This is a, a cool off period between three days and uh, 265, where you can basically be unavailable to use the app during this time. And then self-exclusion, as I said, could be one year, three years, five years or lifetime. And if, uh, again, what we've seen in other jurisdictions, sometimes the, uh, there might be custom period that the specific uh, regulator is looking for, and we would be more than happy to, to cater for that. Also, uh, reality check, you can see it, it's on by default for all customers. Also, for full transparency, the time on site, time on the app per day, it's, it's currently in develop, development, and we believe we will have it in time for the GLI certification for Massachusetts if we have the honor to uh, uh, get the license. So that's something we currently do not offer but we, we will have it in, in the upcoming weeks. That's something we are working right now on from a development perspective. Okay, so these are the RG uh, items. And then, yeah, that's about it in terms of like the product demonstration. As you can see, I will go back to the, to the games. Like we, we really believe that having this kind of an experience where we ask the player a question about the specific event they want to bet on, and give them like clear answers with clear multipliers allows anyone who's a sports fan to, to be able to bet without the learning curve. Currently, research shows that eight in 10 sports betting customers do not understand what American odds mean, how much you will win if you place a bet at plus 200 uh, and, uh, or what the money line or the spread means. So that, that concludes the affirmative part of our presentation. Oh, was there, was there a question? Yeah, this is Commissioner Hill. Can you place a bet for us so I can just see what how the potential payout shows up on your yep. interface here? So let's place $10 on other, other. So the potential payout, you can see uh, the odds have been changing. Uh, is the multiplier is 18, the potential payout is uh, $180. We, believe, we strongly believe that offering this kind of experience will allow customers to learn uh, really fast and have a learning fast learning curve. The feedback we got so far from users is that they don't need to go through an intimidating uh, experience. 
when they place their first bet, not knowing how much they will win or on what they will bet. And if I, if uh, the next play had happened after this particular play, we can go back, sorry. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I need to reshare the screen. One second, starting now. So which one would you want me to open it? So if you go to the player. Okay, player, yes. And then um, I think before you had some choices on uh, who's going to score, I think was. Yeah, I think the, that's here. Player to score the uh, touchdown this drive. Yeah. So as we get closer, uh, so one play goes through, we get closer to the, um, let's say you're on the, ten, you're on the 10 yard line. Are these going to change or do they remain for the uh, rest of the um, until they uh, kick either get a touchdown field goal or kick back off? Is this going to yeah, remain so like is, is others going to stay at 14 or as I get closer for a touchdown or to the, um, you know, five or, yeah. or or 10 yard line? Do those change? Or is that remaining so that, throughout the drive? That's a good question. That's a good question that doesn't have a straight answer because as the uh, markets are driven by machine learning and trading algorithms, they look what happened in the past in similar situations, similar games, uh, similar plays, and they will try to price, so offer the odds based on, on that. So the odds change depending on, on where the game, is, where the ball is, uh, who's on the field, uh, who is, you know, uh, usually maybe scoring from that kind of, of play. So that those are things that are taken into consideration. And yes, you know, those are changing. Uh, there's a lot of factors that going into the, the pricing. Uh, what, we can, what we can tell you is that the pricing is highly accurate. We have been, uh, while launching, launching in Ohio, we have been hitting our margin targets uh, every day. So that gives us pricing confidence on, on the market. So just to be clear, can you go back to the player? Yeah, I think I think I can maybe hopefully clarify. So that the bet was which play, a player was going to score a touchdown. So that's a little difficult to decide. But if the bet was will they score a touchdown as they get closer, you know, the odds will change because that's kind of a, a linear question, so to speak. The issue yeah. with the particular bet was it was kind of a variable question of who's going to score. And there may be if you get closer to the red zone, certain players, we pick the other category. If, if we get closer to the red zone, certain high volume red zone targets, maybe their odds will go up. You know, that that kind of, that that's what makes that particular bet complicated in terms of moving closer to the end zone. But they do dynamically update. So literally every play, the odds are changing. Yeah. And yes. not just for every play, Potential. for every moment of the play could be changed it's because right. the play, you know, things are happening and that's repricing uh, yeah, understood. As a follow up, and I think I understood this in your answer to my earlier question, which was somewhat similar to Commission Pills. So you do use traditional trading services. Yeah, so uh, as we said in our application, uh, SimpleBet is our trading partner, and mm -hmm. uh, that's being actively traded by by them using their own proprietary algorithms and models. Thank you. Madam Chair, that's uh, I've finished with my questions regarding um, this area of the um, presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Ursa, are you have you completed your presentation now altogether? Yes. Yeah. Before you choose, yes. oh, I do want to ask my fellow commissioners, we we take time to ask questions during the demonstration. Anything else? Because I think that um, I just could go back to, to an earlier um, page if you'd like. All right. And Madam Chair, I'm sorry. I keep my, I usually use a mouse for all my um, activity and today I don't have my mouse with me. Oh, so it's sorry, taking me longer, it's have... taking me longer to hit the mute button and, uh, and unmuting. Um, in regards to this portion, I'm all set. If we could go back to the PowerPoint, I think it was the second page. I think I wanted to see the um, organizational chart that they had put up one more time, if that's okay. 
So it's at the beginning, yeah? It's at the beginning, yeah. Mm -hmm. So if we can just keep that up for just a second, please. It's not gonna make any sense right now, but I have a question later, later on and then it will all make sense. So bear with me just one second. And I'm all set. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Commissioner. Excellent. Thank you for that. And, uh, and um, I'm looking at the time. It's 11.33. At this juncture in our agenda, we typically go to our in-house experts. Uh, and um, unless maybe folks might need a 10-minute break and then hear from um, the in-house experts, and then we would uh, pursue our section-by-section -section analysis of the application with a, a lunch break afterwards. How's everybody feeling? Uh, commissioners, do you need a break now, or should we go right into our in-house uh, in experts? Uh, I don't need a break now, but I might need a break before we go section-by-section, -section so we can go internal with the presentations, and then I might need a break. Oh, okay. So why don't we do the internal, um, why don't we do our in-house experts now and then we'll evaluate um, the, uh, the, rest of the, the rest of the day and make sure everyone's on aligned as to our schedule. So thank you and thank you for the outstanding presentation. All right, so um, at this point we have some in-house experts who help us on technology, on the suitability issue and then financial and economic uh, impact. So thank you and Turn to, I see Joe this morning and Gabe, good morning. So I'm gonna give your shout out. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with GLI, GLI is the first to write and set gaming technical standards, which are now considered to be the industry benchmark worldwide. GLI has continuously responded to the industry by innovating new standards and testing, allowing regulators to feel confident that they're providing a safe, responsible method of revenue generation for their stakeholders and the preservation of integrity. So I turn to, to I, uh, Joe and Gabe, and I'll let you introduce yourselves. Thanks. Hi, my name is Joseph Bonavet. I'm Director of Client Solutions at GLI. Uh, today, I'm actually going to hand off the presentation to Gabe Benedict, Client Solutions Executive at GLI and representative from Massachusetts. Uh, Gabe? Uh, th thanks, Joe. And, and uh, thanks, Madam Chair, for having us and members of the commission. As Judge just alluded, uh, my name is Gabe Benedict, and um, I am your Client Solutions representative for the uh, Commonwealth. And uh, I'll be here to give an overview of the submittal uh, certification and verification process regarding mobile applications and other digital platforms approved by the Commission. Uh, the submittal preparation includes the following. If it is a platform we are familiar with, a modification list from the last submission to one or more U.S. jurisdictions will be requested and reviewed to set the project plan for Massachusetts, considering any changes to the platform and all specific Massachusetts rules and regulations. If the product is new to the lab, we will review the technology architect documentation which is a complete, comprehensive, and technically accurate description and explanation of the sports wagering systems. This includes a description of all hardware devices and virtual servers, a description of all server and client software modules, including the software versions, the layout of all the network communications between the various software and hardware modules, and an explanation of all third-party integrated systems. Post the technical documentation review, the critical files regarding compliance will be identified and documented. Then a complete project plan is put in place, taking into account the unique architect and design of the platform and the specific Massachusetts Gaming Commission rules and regulations. The lab will run a, a supervised compilation of those source files, the signature of those files, and the complication steps, and the signatures of the compiled code. Once complete, the source code can be submitted for testing in a locked down environment. GLI will review the player account management platform, known as PAM, 
for registration, age, identification, verification, account controls, payments, reporting, responsible gaming controls, required disclosures, and geolocation. Now, geolocation uh, testing commences in two parts. A field test to verify borders through sampling along the entire border while completing edge case technical tests. The field test would also cover any other restricted areas defined by the Massachusetts Gaming Commission. A submersive workaround detection will commence in the lab, including, but not limited to, VPN and proxies usage, GPS spoofing, code manipulation, and man-in-the-middle attacks. A GLI will verify the sportsbook in total, if not tested previously, for the retail deployment or review the integration of the sportsbook into the PAM for events, markets, point spreads, bet acceptance, and the correspondence, corresponding timestamps and logging. Uh, verify the enforcement of betting limits in all edge cases and verify the pre-event and live data feeds, post-event bet settling, the corresponding timestamps, and all logging and reporting. And then we will review the change management process and procedures. After all the technical checkoffs are met, certifications can be issued when GLI verifies the changes made for Massachusetts specific deployments, including source code differential and change testing to the latest reviewed version. And GLI has evaluated that the product has met all the Commonwealth specific requirements. After certifications are issued and the Massachusetts Gaming Commission accepts them, field verification will be conducted in conjunction with the Massachusetts Gaming Commission. This procedure will be finalized in the upcoming weeks and during that time, the following will commence. Verification at the production server, verify critical file signatures, reviews of internal controls for procedures to operate the book, We'll check technology for configurations such as proper setup of roles and user right assignments and potentially interview key personnel to ensure they know and will follow procedures from the internal controls. And then at this point, they will have met the technical requirements for operations of a sports book in the Commonwealth. That's all I got. Questions for Gabe. Gabe, can I ask a question? I understand that SimpleBet has been licensed in several states as a platform. Is GLI familiar with SimpleBet as the betting platform? Yes, we are. Yeah, yes. Yep. Yep. Uh, Better and SimpleBet have uh, been through uh, GLI 33. Right, and I understood better. So, and SimpleBet is its, it's um, underlying platform. And then, did you do all, I think I read maybe that you did all those certifications except for- That's correct. Okay. Yep. Yep. We're very familiar with the, the product and the platform. Okay, excellent, thank you. Yep. Anything else for Joe and Gabe? Good to see you, thank you. Good morning. As well. Okay. Now we turn to our own um, um, IED, our Investigations and Enforcement Bureau. And today it looks like we have Councilor Kramer. Good morning. Good morning, Chair. Uh, good morning, Chair and Commissioners. The IEB submitted a report regarding the preliminary suitability of Better Holdings, which is doing businesses better. This applicant is seeking an untethered Category 3 license. The IEB performed this review for preliminary suitability in accordance with the standards and criteria set forth in 205 CMR 215.01 subsection 2. As a precursor to this review, the licensing division in conjunction with the IEB performed a scoping review of the applicant under section 5B of 23N and we identified one entity and two individuals that we designated as qualifiers in connection with Better's application. Those qualifiers are listed on pages one and two of our report. The licensing division has performed a review of the existing, existing submissions for deficiencies 
Uh, and at this point, there are no substantive deficiencies. There has been, though, ongoing communication over pieces between the applicant and licensing. As mentioned, the IEB review was performed in accordance with the reg. The governing regulation is set forth on page three of the report. I again note that this review was for preliminary suitability. We did not perform a full suitability investigation. Our team was comprised of contract investigators, including former members of the State Police Gaming Enforcement Unit, which is attorney Mike Banks and his team, as well as contract investigators from the firm of RSM. Their work was being performed with the collaboration and the oversight of the IEB. Uh, the review for preliminary suitability is summarized in the report, and it includes a summary of Better's licensing status as disclosed in its application, a summary of compliance history in other jurisdictions as disclosed in its application, a summary of pending litigation valued at over 100,000 as disclosed in its application, a summary of the open source review of the applicant and individual qualifiers, but not entity qualifiers. And res with respect to the RSM side, that team prepared the report that appears as exhibit one. Uh, they reviewed the disclosed financial information of the applicant. They presented financial ratios. Uh, they reviewed forecasting submissions submitted by the applicant and its general application. Uh, and they summarized the self-reported history of judgments. Uh, at this point, I would otherwise rest on the report. Um, we have members of uh, the state police uh, side of the house and uh, RSM, of course, for any questions that the commission may have. Commissioners, questions for Councilor Kramer. Madam Chair, um, I'm not sure if we want to hold our questions until the suitability uh, side of our section by section or if we actually want to um, talk about a couple of issues that we may have now. Kathleen, and I'm just as happy be, to wait. Yeah, Kathleen, are you gonna be available? Um, yes, so I plan to be on the meeting. So whenever it's convenient for uh, the commission, it's fine with me. I, if, if you wouldn't mind, I would suggest that um, we do have RSM coming up. And so this would allow for us to address those suitability questions in conjunction with section, primarily section G, but also section E. Sure. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, um, Kathleen. Uh, Commissioner O'Brien, are you? I thought I saw you leaning in. I, I know I did. I have I have a number of questions, um, but I'll hold them until we go through the section by section and hear from RSM. Okay, excellent. Thank you. All set, Commissioner Skinner and Commissioner Maynard. All right, great. So now we'll turn to um, RSM. I see Connor. Good morning. Hi, good morning, Madam Chair. Um, let me introduce RSM. RSM US LLP is one of the leading providers of audit tax and consulting services in the United States. RSM has been working with the Gaming Commission to provide insights and analyses to help us. I'd like um, to, at this point, turn it over to Connor Laughlin, and you can introduce yourself, and I don't know if you have a colleague joining you today or not. Thank you. Uh, no, I'm uh, flying solo, but I also uh, share my screen. Okay, excellent. Can everyone see that? Not yet. There we go. Okay, great. Excellent. Good morning, I'm Connor Lachlan, a director at RSM Strategic Finance and Financial Planning and Analysis Practice. I have uh, 12 years of business restructuring, finance, and investment banking experience. Um, RSM uh, appreciates the opportunity to present to the Massachusetts Gaming Commission. We understand the importance of the licensing process and the importance of these meetings. Um, as Commissioner Judd Stein has indicated, the RSM team has been asked to join the meeting and make a presentation related to certain aspects of the applications. Um, please note RSM is not presenting on all aspects of the application. Specifically, RSM has been asked to provide insights based on our experience and research into the following specific application sections. Um, the description of better sports wagering operation, their projected uh, revenue for the state of Massachusetts, and uh, the applicant's financial stability and integrity to operate in the state of Massachusetts. We will also provide any general observations that we conclude may benefit the commission in their review of the applicant. Uh, the three areas RSM will speak to today include an overview of the sports 
betting market in Massachusetts and the U.S., and how RSM utilized certain market data to test financial projections, applicant projected GGR, uh, market share, and hold percentages, and finally, an analysis of the applicant's current liquidity position. Uh, we will reserve sections uh, two and three for executive session. Uh, similar to other presentations, I will begin by providing some insight into how third-party equity analysts are estimating the current market size and whole percentage um, uh, in the U.S. and Massachusetts. Uh, RSM utilized market research to test the reasonableness of each of the Category 3 financial projections. Um, as illustrated on slide four, uh, we've compared the total applicant pool's estimated market share to how the market is estimating the current Massachusetts addressable market in terms of gross gaming revenue. As presented, the current applicant pool is estimating that the Massachusetts market will be approximately 300 million higher in 2027. Please note that no one has a crystal ball in estimating the total opportunity for the Boston addressable online sports betting market. And the combined applicant pool estimation may very well be appropriate. In addition to the market size, RSM also looked into the year-over-year -year growth trends estimates as provided by Truist and Deutsche Bank market research from the state of Massachusetts in order to again test the reasonableness of each applicant's projections. The chart presented here excludes 2023 through 2024 as this, estimate, this is estimated to be beyond 300% growth. Generally speaking, better's growth rate for 2024 through 2027 is on the high side, but directionally in line with third party estimates. Moving on to slides six and seven, we wanted to provide some insight into the total iGaming market share. The current U.S. market is dominated by three major players. FanDuel at 33%, followed by BetMGM at 21%, and DraftKings at 19% are the current top players in the, in the U.S. OSB market and iGaming market. Finally, um, RSM utilize information from other states and third-party research to develop a benchmark for hold percentage. We have deduced that a range of 8 to 12 percent is the likely range in competitive states, which is you can see here on the, on the chart that the 8 percent is likely the median hold percentage for these applicants, and that's what they're likely going to achieve. Um, I will now provide a, a high-level overview of our observations regarding the applicant's financial projections. Better is a privately held pre-revenue company at the time of their application submission. It did not have any active sports books in any jurisdiction, having only received conditional approval of the Ohio Casino Control Commission at the time of its Massachusetts application. The applicant did provide historical financials since they were founded in August 2021. However, the scope of the operations to date are extremely limited. Better did did provide a comprehensive view of projected operations and forecast financials for the state of Massachusetts. As I spoke to earlier, RSM reviewed the applicant's revenue projection information and compared it to the market ana analyses from Deutsche Bank Equity Research Report and True Securities Equity Research. Game industry, both, both of these reports were issued in October of, of last year. For our detailed revenue projection commentary, an executive session is warranted as RSM's planned discussion contains non-public information in regard to Better's estimated market share. For this public hearing, I'll provide a high level of Better's financial projections and will hold specific non-public information for executive session. The applicant's forecast methodology with estimating <clears throat> began with estimating the total number of paid users on its app, followed by estimating the average handle and gross gaming revenue for each of those users to reach a Massachusetts market handle and GGR. Without any operating history, it is difficult to form a full opinion on these projections, but we can state publicly that they anticipate capturing material portion of the Massachusetts market. Additionally, as better presented earlier, better business model is different from other applicants as it will rely on providing what they refer to as micro bets, rather than betting on the outcome of, of the full game. The offering will focus on bets on individual plays if bad that's pitches, et cetera, relying on the co consumer to be actively engaged during the sporting contest. In our experience, in-game betting offerings have a higher hold percentage or margin than simple game outcome-based bets. 
based on this business model, the applicant projects achieving a higher whole percentage than we would otherwise expect in Massachusetts. But this is reasonable given the context. This isn't to say the applicant's projections are, are inaccurate, but rather may be aggressive. As previously shared, the applicant had no historical track record in other states at the time of its application. So there's no way to compare its projection against past performance. Additionally, there is inherent uncertainty over the ultimate market size of sports wagering in Massachusetts. With that, this concludes RSM's current presentation. I'll, I'll remain on the line to answer any questions the question may have about this presentation or our written submission. If there are further specific questions on the contents of our written report, we are happy to discuss those in executive session. Questions for Connor? Um, Connor, you want to bring down your slide? Yeah, I'm trying to figure out how to do that. <laughs> I'll, I'll log out of the meeting and log back in. No, okay, I don't want to lose you. Or I'll stay on just for a second. Oh, Connor, I have one question, but I want to yield to my other uh, fellow commissioners if they have any. Okay. Oh, thank you. Here you are. So, Connor, I understand that um, this, this is a, a new venture, so that you didn't have the data, of course, they launched in Ohio. So it was uh, post the, the submission of the application. But they did explain in the um, in the um, application, the, um, the fact that they launched this free-to-play um, program in 48 states. Are you able to extrapolate anything from the success that they, there's no dollars attached, but there's, there's player numbers that are coming out. Were you able to extrapolate from that in any way for guidance? Um, we, we did not investigate that as part of our of our analysis as we our focus was was generally on the application submission and just overall kind of market share to kind of set the bar for some of the revenue projections we're seeing yeah. but um that's something if you'd like us to uh take a look at we can most certainly do that and, and that's fair it may have been outside the parameters of your of the scope of your um assignment so if you uh mr levy you can just we we can put that in the parking lot and maybe that can be something we can address in our our section by section analysis. So thank you. Um, okay. Madam Chair. Yes. Connor, um, can you just kind of elaborate a little bit more about the in game betting uh, revenues that you're seeing, not only potentially here in Massachusetts, but across the United States? Because this seems to be a theme that's uh, being talked about a lot more, uh, certainly in this application, but certain. And others as well. So, can you just kind of educate us a little bit about this in-game versus just doing the straight sure. betting at the beginning of a game, and yeah, how well, you think it's going to affect revenues here in Massachusetts you know, what, and this what application? We, oh, sorry. What, yes, Commissioner. Uh, what we've observed is that you know several other platforms are providing that same type of betting. Um, where it can be, you know, whether it's gonna, there's going to be a touchdown on the next play or whether, they're, you know, the batter is going to strike out on the next play. And, you know, and the odds um, around those can be, you know, very wild in, in the ranges of, you know, a touchdown being come, occurring on the next play would the odds would be very high if you were to hit that. Um, as far as, you know, how to view what, you know, that particular segment of revenues by applicant, you know, that, that information, I don't think is provided publicly by um, at least the public players like DraftKings. Um, so it's hard to ascertain, you know, how that level of, or that particular type of bet will perform on just, you know, a single platform. But, um, you know, it is something to say that, you know, all of the major players are providing that type of, of bet on their platform. So there, there must be some type of popularity, you know, when it comes to betting on that type of um, game. Thank you, Madam Chair. Any other questions for Connor? Okay, let's do a check-in then. Thank you, uh, Connor. Thank you to RSM.
So now would we, um, it's noon. Would we like to take a short break and then we turn to our section by section analysis before lunch, or do we want to have a quick lunch? Commissioner O'Brien, I'll turn to you. I think it might make sense to take the lunch break now and then see if we can go okay. through as much as possible in the afternoon. Okay. But so if people, I, I wait if people don't want to do it, but that seems like the most sense. That sounds good to me. Okay. And some, uh, Mr. Levy and team, um, it's noon. You could return at 12:30. Uh, that would work for us. How's that work for your team? Great. Okay. Yep. Uh, that work sounds good to us. Okay. Excellent. Um, and so, to the public, we will be returning uh, at 12:30. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
Great. Thank you. Great. I see we've got most of the applicant. Maybe okay. Great. Thank you. Great. Well, we'll get started. This is. Massachusetts Gaming Commission reconvening. And this is meeting number 421. And because we're holding this meeting virtually, I need to take roll call. Good afternoon, Commissioner O'Brien. Good afternoon, I'm here. Good afternoon, Commissioner Hill. Hello, I'm here. Good afternoon, Commissioner Skinner. Good afternoon. And good afternoon, Commissioner Maynard. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, I am here. Excellent. We'll get started. And again, thank you to Better for its uh, presentation and demonstration this morning and to our in house experts. Uh, this now leads us to item, I guess it's 4C on the agenda. And this is where we will begin our overall evaluation of the application um, that's been submitted by Better Holdings Inc. And they refer to their the company as Better. And um, I'm proposing that we walk through the application as we've done with respect to the other applications that have come before us over the last month or so. Uh, but we would consider whether the applicant's response and proposal meets expectations, exceeds expectations, or fails to meet expectations. In this context, though, since we will have to consider the applications holistically at the conclusion of this individual review, this initial assessment as to whether the expectations have been met will be preliminary in nature, just to see whether we have a general consensus. And that uh, assessment is subject to modification once we have a chance to move through our evaluations of each application and the broader landscape is in greater focus. We have built-in flexibility commissioners. And a reminder to each of you that one or more commissioners may seek supplemental information from the applicant to any component of their application. Part of this process, we also want to keep in mind that we um, may consider you know, imposing any conditions that we might like to see in the event that a license is awarded to this applicant. And I'm a reminder to all um, at the end of this process, on or about the 18th or 19th, um, that's when we will identify. Well, there's any variation between the applicant's proposal in this category as it's related to others, and we'll be making our decision. So with that, we'll get started unless there's questions or additions. All right. So let's look at section B of the application. Commissioners, do you have questions? <clears throat> I have a general question. Um, it relates to simple bet uh, and the ownership interest held by uh, Mr. Paul and Mr. Levy. Um, I understood in reading the application that you were using the better is using the simple bet platform, but didn't really understand that to include trading services. So I'm, I'm glad you specified that, um, but it makes my question that much more relevant. How do you intend to handle any conflicts that may arise um, in the simple bet uh, platform, simple bet in general uh, that come that come before you, uh, Mr. Levy and Mr. Paul, in your capacity uh, as uh, better executives? Sure. So just, what what insure, what assurances can you give um, that will um, 
demonstrate that you are maintaining, you intend to maintain the integrity uh, of both entities. Sure. Um, I guess it's important to point out that I am, you know, 100% full time on better and, and only a fiduciary of, of better. So I am, I, I am no longer a, a fiduciary in any capacity uh, for, for Simple Bet Inc. Uh, I am a, a, an individual large shareholder of the company, but uh, my economic interest is, is far greater and better. I am a fiduciary only of better. Um, and um, yeah, I, I, I think given that it, it's, it's quite clear that, you know, we, we, we deliberately set this up such that, um, you know, trying to avoid any sort of conflicts of interest uh, while creating a, a structure that was ultimately value creative to, to both businesses. And who, and are, did I, and I'm trying to find it, I'm, I'm working from a paper copy and so I have tabbed my pages, but that doesn't seem to be helping me at all. But are there individuals at Better who serve on the board of directors for Simple Bet or vice versa? Yes, there, there's a couple of mutual board directors. So, so Greg Alinsky is, is on the board of both Simple Bet and Better, um, as well as Jeffrey Wu. Uh, Nikki Sabadarian, who is a, a board director of, of Better, is, is also a board observer of, uh, of Simple Bet. Um, Ashwin, is, is anything I missed over there? No, no, I think that's kind of the clarification that we should provide here is that Simple Bet is a, a significant shareholder in Better and is a key vendor of ours. But in terms of, you know, for Joey and Jake, there's no conflict of interest there. There are board, there are directors who are Simple Bet directors who serve as directors on, in our organization. But um, you know that that's the the limit of the overlap there. Okay, but I am focusing on trying to focus on the conflict of interest aspect and just wanting some assurances that you have a structure in place to identify any uh, if they should arise. Yes, and so we that's part of our board um, setup and our charter is that for any transactions where simple bet would be involved, any better simple bet negotiations. So these licenses were put in place uh, well in advance, but anything future on those um, agreements would be negotiated and dealt with from the board members that are independent of simple bet. Thank you. Other questions under section B? I'm gonna ask uh, Mr. Levy, I, I thought you might be wanting to respond to, I think, RSM's comments where there was a question about, uh, or there, was, there were comments about uh, in-play bets being more popular now. And, and I, I noted language I didn't completely understand, so I wanted clarification on that, but I thought it would also allow you to be able to explain how your platform may just be different from the other um, operators platforms that are in play um, that's in um, the statement that I was that I said I should ask them to tell me a little bit more about this it's like in play betting has been predominantly limited to enabling users to bet on price fluctuations of match outcome based betting markets during the event and I'm can, I'm guessing what that means but it, that might be a problem for you or not thanks So I'm sorry, just to clarify that the question is. Is um, how, um, what does that mean in terms of other, other platforms really base the price fluctuations because they're, they're relying more on match. Sure. And I understand that that's not what you're doing here with your micro padding. And then also the follow-up would be, it gives you an opportunity to how more, how more succinctly you can distinguish your platform from uh, what really was stemmed from Commissioner Hill's earlier question about, you know, in-play betting generally? Sure. Um, so with respect to the first question, um, generally, you know, before micro, the, the proliferation of, of micro betting, which is still very much, uh, you know, in, in its infancy in, in the U.S. market, and, um, you know, we see better as the first direct-to-consumer company that that is really pioneering this, and, and Simple Bet is, is obviously the technology provider that is focused on it. Um, but historically, 
in play betting, which in more mature markets like the UK, for example, you know, it's been quoted to take up to, you know, 70 to 80 percent of total betting handle is still predominantly that match outcome based market, like a money line of who will win or lose the game, team A versus team B. And users are placing a bet on who will win or lose that game at any point during the game as the probability of the outcome uh, fluctuates as things in the game happen uh, that would influence those probabilities. Um, and, and that's generally been the extent of in-play betting um, across the global sports betting marketplace to date. Um, but part of the, the product thesis we had at SimpleBet and, and, and obviously at Better is that U.S. sports specifically have a composition and cadence that lend themselves very well to not just match outcome based in play betting, but to enabling users to bet on the discrete moments that drive U.S. sports consumption. If you look at a baseball game, for example, uh, it's driven by pitches and at bats with plenty of time between each of those occurrences to uh, enable a user to place a bet. Uh, American football is driven by plays and drives and you know, there, there's typically about 35 or so seconds between each play of a, of a football game. And even basketball, which is a more fluid game like like soccer, um, is, is, is still driven by dozens of possessions and a lot of scoring and a lot of superstar players and speculation over what those players will do next. For example, being able to bet that, you know, LeBron James's next made basket will be a, a two-pointer, three-pointer free throw is, is, is a product that we think consumers would be interested in, in engaging with and um, lends itself well to, to NBA, despite it being a fluid sport. From a product standpoint, we're a big believer in, in, in having a very focused approach. We view a lot of the legacy sportsbook platforms, as I alluded to during the presentation, as offering almost like a supermarket of different sports betting products. And they're, and they're generally sort of uh, displaying odds in, in a spreadsheet-like format with dozens of tabs and um, dozens to hundreds of betting markets per page. And we think to, again, we view sports betting as a way to enhance the consumption of, of sports and, and specifically in our case, live sports. And um, enabling and, and, and having a very focused user experience that makes it really simple and intuitive for somebody to uh, engage with a particular product is something that's really important to us versus overwhelming users with, again, a supermarket of different sports betting products. So we're very focused on the micro and in-play betting experience because we think that it lends itself very nicely to the cadence and, and composition of U.S. sports. And um, you know that, and, and from a product standpoint, when you when you look at our experience, it's it's pretty, it's a pretty simple, intuitive UI um, that that makes it uh, you know pretty apparent that that's the core product experience. And we think methodically over time, we can layer in match outcome based markets in the simple, intuitive UI that that you currently see on the Better app. Um, but but we believe in taking a very focused product approach, um, which is why we, we like to describe as what we're doing initially, at least, as, as unbundling micro betting, really focused on that experience and then layering in uh, the, the other types of betting markets at a, at a later date versus overwhelming users with so many different options that they can't really, you know, interpret to begin with, given what Alex previously noted about, you know, eight out of 10 sports fans don't intuitively understand that minus 175 means to bet 175 to win 100, for example. Um, so so we're, we're just taking a very focused product approach and, and really trying to be the first operator that that has you know definitively found product market fit in this category before we, we spend a bunch of money on, on nationwide expansion and, and customer acquisition. Thank you. Other questions, commissioners on section B? Madam Chair. Yeah. Um, so I, I found the information around broadcast latency very interesting. Um, can you describe kind of the challenges for now and kind of how you see overcoming those challenges? Sure, I would say there, there's a couple of primary challenges. One is, um, you know, providing users enough contextual match state data within the applicant within the better app to enable them to have all the information that they need without zero, without any sort of latency, 
um, to enable them to, to place an informed bet and not feel like they're they're almost front running the the linear television broadcast. And and if you use the better app, you'll see that we have uh, this single screen experience with a visualization of of the game for for our American football product, and, and we plan on releasing that for for baseball and basketball at some point as well. Um, looking at better as, as, as really a single screen experience and, and that capacity. Um, ultimately, we, we think better will, will also thrive as a, as a second screen experience. And I'll note that, you know, you could almost delineate micro markets in, in terms of instant micros and core micros. And I would say instant micros like pitch by pitch and play by play may be, you know, candidly a little bit challenging in this interim period as a second screen experience with the current paradigm of broadcast latency, but betting on an upcoming drive or an upcoming at bat is still uh, far less sensitive to broadcast latency as a second screen experience. And, and, and we view that as, as a really effective tool for, to, to enable sports fans to enhance their consumption of, of sports. Um, one thing, uh, you know, to, to note that I've spoken publicly about is we, we ultimately think that, you know, there may even be an opportunity for, for companies like, you know, better and, and other sports wagering platforms to, to even, you know, have live sports media rights in some capacity within our experience with, within our uh, consumer experience. And, um, you know, we're, we're pretty far away from, from enabling that to, to exist, but, but ultimately controlling the video capture and, and having a zero latency experience within the app is something that uh, we ultimately uh, strive to, to accommodate, but, but, you know, managing expectations that that will take some time uh, given the expenses um, associated with that. Thank you. Other questions under section B, Commissioner Ryan? Um, so I noted that you're, I mean, we're calling them tethered. Um, proprietor base seems to be the phrase that Ohio uses. So you are linked to uh, a presence in Ohio for that license. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. And if you can answer this question, is that the same for the other jurisdictions you're pending in or? Or any of them, uh, is it's where you would be untethered, as we said. Yes. So, so Maryland would be would be untethered. It would be very similar to the Massachusetts uh, structure. Okay. Uh, I was happy to hear that you have in fact launched because when I looked at this and as submitted, I was concerned about coming forward on an app that hadn't actually launched. So you spoke on it briefly, but can you reiterate to the extent you can publicly how that launch has gone since January one in Ohio? Yeah. yeah, so uh, we we launched, in, we did like a soft launch for a period of time to make sure things are working uh, well, especially being, you know, our first start state to go live with a new wagering platform. So that what that meant is we, did, we didn't took user deposits initially. Uh, so we allowed users to sign up, verify their identity and receive the bonus to play on the platform that allows us to go through a testing period to make sure, again, everything works at fine and uh, to tweak any 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 things to our systems, which to be honest, we haven't encountered any major issues. I think, you know, we had some small uh, settlement delays, which we actually uh, addressed on, on day one. And we are actually right now, the team uh, during the launch break announced that they, they are deciding to turn on payments today. We are happy with what we have seen so far. We're going to start a slow rollout on payments also. We're going to start with debit card only deposit and withdrawals. And again, because we want to monitor transactions, we want to make sure the funds are flowing correctly in, funds are flowing correctly out. And we're just going to add uh, the next payment methods in the next couple of weeks, PayPal and online banking. And again, we're taking this phased approach to, let's say, do a self-control soft launch just to make sure everything is fine and consumers have a good experience with us because we are a new uh, sports book. And we definitely don't want to go, we haven't gone aggressive on acquisition, uh, just to give us time to uh, address any any potential issues that we would see. But so far, we, we are really happy with what we've seen. So you're technically still in your soft launch right now, kind of ramping up? You're not yeah, so, full on yet, right? So we will be full on before the end of the day today, actually. That we received all okay. the green lights that we were able to receive money and money out. And again, we, we, we took this step just to make sure we are taking the right approach and we're not putting consumers at risk in, in any way, given mm -hmm. that's a new product and uh, any new product usually needs a bit of, you know, I think it, I, I would like saying that you do a launch 
first time launch and everything worked perfectly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm not saying this is a deficiency, Madam Chair, but what I would ask is that between obviously now and when uh, they're back in terms of when we're doing adjudications and votes, that if there's any material change based on the rollout in Ohio in terms of your ability, um, that you advise MGC yeah. so that we know about it. So what we could do, uh, Ashwin, we could inform MGC and soon, as soon as we turn on deposit and withdrawal, which again, we expect to be later today if uh, no, other, no issues are uh, encountered. We have been testing this feature for the last uh, week. And again, we are comfortable uh, doing it today. And again, for full transparency, we wanted actually to do it yesterday to come today and say, hey, we have deposit and withdrawals. But... Uh, as a production system needs to go through, uh, we, we had some confirmations from the uh, bank that's actually processing the payments that they wanted to make sure everything is going fine. And we received this like so during lunch. We'll provide an update. I know the 19th and the 20th are your date. So we'll, we'll yeah. provide an update prior to that. Great, thank you. Other questions under section B? I'm going to follow up on, give you the opportunity, Mr. Levy, or, or your team, um, to uh, let us know how the free-to-play uh, program that you launched in 48 states, um, how that informed what you're doing in Ohio and what you're proposing here in Massachusetts. And then I guess the second question I would ask is, I presume that there was maybe I'm wrong, uh, no age limit on that because it was free to play. And is there any intention of using any of the data that you uh, accumulated during that free to play period for in Massachusetts, for instance? Sure, I'll, I'll address the, the first part of the question and I'll hand it off to Ashwin and Alex to address the second part of that question. Um, with, with respect to free to play as noted during the presentation, um, despite, not really any paid user acquisition spend. Uh, we have over 120,000 uh, downloads. Uh, the engagement uh, on that experience has been uh, generally quite quite positive. Um, and uh, but but I do want to to note that you know this product experience. We we didn't design a bespoke free to play game. Um, for free to play purposes, and then have a different experience for real money betting. Um, we very much view free to play as a way to one register and onboard users nationwide, um, so that we can, you know, have some sort of customer base in jurisdictions as we get market access and licenses, and as those states legalize. Um, and two, to provide a, you know, a bit of an interactive tutorial for what, what's a pretty new. Uh, product experience that hasn't really been released in, in the market yet without American odds, displaying betting markets as intuitive multiple choice questions with a focus on micro and in-play betting. Um, so, so, you know, candidly, not really taking sort of any sort of cohort analysis with the free-to-play experience with any sort of, um, you know, not, not viewing that as having any sort of like profound business implications. We, we, we've launched that experience for those two purposes predominantly and, uh, you know, otherwise have, have been satisfied with, with um, you know, how that product is performed. Um, Ashwin, Alex, I'll let you address the second part of that question. Yeah, uh, uh, you know, as we said in our presentation, all of our products are 21 plus, so the, so the same requirement applies to the, to the free-to-play product. Yeah, I think, uh, again, looking at the free-to-play market for all operators in, in the U.S., for free-to-play, usually there's a third certification, you're 21, there's no comprehensive age checks uh, via third parties. And again, we are open to discuss that with MGC. And if you know, we find that, that that's a desired approach, we, we can enforce the uh, comprehensive identity and uh, age verification also for uh, free to play. But what we've done so far is really in line with the industry uh, without naming other operators. Basically, we took the same approach where uh, it, uh, you know, customers can sign up and self-certify their 21 and plus, but we're more, as just to conclude, we're more than happy to enforce uh, comprehensive identity and uh, age verification on the free-to-play experience. Thank you. Thanks. Other questions? 
So one question, Commissioner Hill, uh, it, you often ask it, but in terms of customer service, I wondered if you, do you want to ask that question, Commissioner Hill? Or? I can certainly uh, ask it. It's something we're all concerned about. If there's an issue uh, for a consumer or a customer, what is your customer service um, hours of operation? Is it done through chat? Is it done through a uh, phone number? Both? How do we yeah. move forward if there's an issue? So uh, we offer customer service 24 seven. Uh, right now, the way it works, uh, when you reach out, you have two verticals. One is a self-service por portal where you can read the most important, you know, uh, items we know we might reach out to us, for example, how long will it take for my withdrawal to be approved or how long, why is my identity not verified? So how do I reset my password? Those things that usually a customer can self-serve. Then if that's not enough, they are, a, they, they are able to uh, turn on and engage with, our, with us. Basically the experience there is we're offering again, predefined categories, which the customer can choose do they have like a, an account issue, a payment issue, a responsible gambling uh, question and so on. And so we can filter out and provide them first a set of articles and answers right away. And if uh, they are not satisfied with those solutions, we give them the option to reach out to us. Right now, uh, what we do is uh, we create the tickets as emails and uh, we treat them as live chat. We are looking to move into uh, live chat once we're uh, out of the soft uh, launch period. But right now for us, it has been more efficient to basically to receive the tickets as emails. You don't need to write us an email. It's the same experience as, as a chat, but we we uh, basically it's a, it's a asynchronous communication between us and the customer. Commissioner Hill, all set? Yep, all set. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. And so could I just follow up on that? And maybe I just missed it as you were speaking, but is there an option in terms of if something goes awry in the account, maybe you've lost control of the account to contact someone via phone immediately? Uh, right now, no, but I, we, we are definitely open to, uh, I think, in, engage with a, a solution that, uh, again, is on the market with uh, callback uh, with an instant callback. Yeah, I mean, because I think the fear is um, the damage that can be done and the time that it may take to get a response and the other methods of communication you just yeah. talked about. Yeah, we totally understand that. And that's one of the reasons we are enforcing two-factor authentication, for example. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we while that customer can disable, disable it, we believe that that should eliminate about 95, 97% of uh, account takeover situations. And then I'm, I'm sure everything's in English. Do you have any plans for any other languages besides English in terms of being able to communicate for customer service? Uh, right now, not officially. Uh, the good news is that our, some of our customer agent service actually are, are fluent in, in Spanish, coincidence, just because like be, living in, in Miami and having people employed in Miami, there's a large uh, uh, Latino community here. So if someone would reach out, for example, in Spanish, we will be able to, to serve them, like, at least to, uh, to address, but not other language. And we necessarily do not plan to do that officially right now. Okay, thanks. So maybe what's the size of the better workforce? How many employees? Oh, so, uh, are you moving yep. on to, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, this is this is this is me. It's just in relation to the follow-up to one of the questions around customer support. Okay, I thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, I can jump in there, uh, Ashwin Krishnan again. Uh, we currently have 27 full-time employees. And how many of those folks are responsible for customer service responses? Is it four plus six? Six. And okay, thank you. Thanks, Commissioner Skinner. My apologies. Um, so, other questions for Section B? So, I just want to make a, a note um, as we continue on uh, reviewing the application, there are points in time where the app the applicant and in the presentation even looks as though they may be responsive to the um, series of meetings that we have. And I just wanna give uh, your team credit because uh, everything the best was in the application and preceded the presentation. So in, in so many ways, you, you um, 
anticipated many of the issues that we have been bringing up in our last meetings and I wanted to give you credit for those who haven't read your, your application. So, and that will come up particularly in the, in the next section. So thank you for um, being responsive in that way um, without, without even knowing our, our particular direct questions we've been asking over the last several weeks. Um, so I need to take a, find out if we have a consensus on B. Commissioner Hill. I would be comfortable saying that this applicant has met expectations for section B. I agree. The applicant meets. I would agree with that. Okay. okay. If I could just make one comment, Madam Chair, before we go to section C. I am a little concerned at what I just heard about the customer service piece of um, this applicant. And I would hope that you really take into consideration what we have said today uh, regarding being able to get to a customer service rep, uh, a live person a little quicker than I think um, you're allowing today. That's something okay, we're, totally. concerned, we're concerned about for all applicants. And I would hope that you hear loud and clear that that's something that we hope that you will uh, re-engage in in your conversations. Yeah, we, we heard that feedback. What, what we can commit to is as we, if we get a privilege to launch Massachusetts, we definitely will add more agents to our team. That's not our existing team for full suite of products. And as we grow, we add. We also have a, I would say a mentality that's customer focused. So if we see something that's a top issue, like that's not necessarily solved by throwing more people, we need to solve that issue first. So that's one. And then secondly, we will be more than happy to communicate our plans to grow the, the customer service team and uh, even give uh, clarity on our plans there in the future. Uh, thank you for allowing me to make that editorial, Madam Chair. I'm ready to move forward. Well, well and, and we, we can build on it if you'd like, but I think to just add to Commissioner Hill's point, um, I know that we think about whether someone sees that their account is being Act and, and we want to be able to make sure that a customer can get immediate help on that front. But I'm also, and I, know, I suspect all of my fellow commissioners join me, that we, we worry about the uh, customer who is in stress um, because of, of um, responsible gaming, problem gaming issues. And so the customer service component, that live person could be truly, truly instrumental in a, in a period of stress. And so we we um, have seen many of the applications where there's trained folks on RG matters to be able to assist in that. So the customer service component, sometimes we know the applicants can get that right, but it is a complex uh, piece with respect to mental health and, and gambling. So I don't know if we want anything supplemental on that, Commissioner Hill. I think I'm hearing that they heard us, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we, we heard you and uh... Very important for us. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Then, Commissioner Skinner, I did not, I thought you were jumping, and it was my, my apologies that made perfect sense your last question. I turn to questions uh, section C, and if you would like, I give you the first question if, you, if you're ready. And if you're not, somebody else can go. I just, um, I know that you typically ask questions around this section. Commissioners? I, Madam Chair. Thank you. I, I would like not as much a question as a comment and an observation. Um, I've kind of beat the drum on the, uh, along with Commissioner Skinner and others on the lottery question. And when I was reading your application, um, you know, we were talking about this issue in September, uh, you hit exactly kind of what I was wanting to see in, in terms of really thinking outside the box and how you can collaborate. And so I appreciate it, um, whether it comes to fruition or not. Um, I, I appreciate the fact that you're thinking that way and that um, it seems like you are really committed to engaging with the, with the treasurer and the treasurer's office. Follow up on that, commissioners. That was one of my. I, I would say the same thing. Yeah. 
it's one of the few that have actually been specific about concepts as opposed to just a, a statement of intent. And it was fully developed in the application. So thank you for that. Um, I, I think um, the presentation today clarified to me what you had in mind a bit too, in terms of the um, innovation. Um, Oh, it looked like Commissioner Hill was going to go. I talked plenty. Okay. I'll defer. To Commissioner Hill. I, I will always yield <laughs> to Commissioner O'Brien. I, I think it was Commissioner Skinner who actually was first. I, who's yielding to who? Likewise, I will always yield to Commissioner O'Brien. So <laughs> uh, right ahead. Now, now the expectations are there, right? I, um, I had a, a couple questions, and I realized some of this may be um, what we're going to get to in executive session, but. Some of the responses in terms of projected revenue, the analysis, the assumptions were rather vague. Some of them refer to iGaming potentially, which we don't have in the Commonwealth. Um, I'm sure you saw how long it was for sports wagering to be legislated in. So I don't know that that's a sort of a viable assumption to put in at this point. Um, and in your answer to C2C1 about projected revenue, when they we asked for any studies or projections and the bases for it, um, you know, the response just said you're assuming a 20% tax rate. And so I'm looking for more information on that. And I know that some will be coming us uh, from RSM, but I, Madam Chair, I just wanted to flag that, that I'm assuming we're going to be getting more detail on that in executive session. Yes, we're more than happy to discuss all the financials and the projections and, and all the assumptions um, in executive session as, as um, we believe it's appropriate. Okay. I think RSM noted that they expected the, the, uh, the details to be in executive session. Um, I think what they did reveal is very public, correct, Commissioner Bryan? So, um, well, I just, yeah, I'm, I'm not seeing anything even that we were able to review in advance. And so that's the concern that I have. I see. Um, and then as far as the rest of um, C, I have some other questions. I don't know, they, they pertain to some of the other offerings in terms of, um, you know, the, the anticipated or um, the possibility of another, you know, brick and mortar location with employees based out of here was all very specific and very, you know, nice to hear. Again, that's not a lot of specifics that we were getting from particularly mobile only. Um, so I did want to laud you for that. And if, if in fact you are here, that would be good to see come to fruition. Um, I think there was a couple other areas I was hoping for more specifics on. Um, but in particular, I want to ask about, um, I think it was C5A in community engagement of 106, 107, where you talk about the relationships with um, some of the schools in the area. And if this is something that's not out there uh, publicly, and this is better for executive session for some reason, let me know. Um, but as I scan through particularly the uh, university uh, letter of intent, um, I had been hoping to see something more targeting um, underprivileged communities for opportunities as opposed to um, an institution itself. So if you can elaborate on how that's gonna benefit the community beyond a rather well-endowed educational institution, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, happy to do that. And thank you for the question. Uh, you know, I think in our effort to show that, you know, this was, uh, you know, a serious commitment and something that we really wanted to show that we were serious about, we wanted to show that we had gone beyond just conversations with people, but they actually, you know, formulated something. And I know the letter itself is vague, but given the kind of short window we had, we, you know, we reached out to folks that we had relationships with. And so, you know, I certainly have relationships at Harvard Law School and I was able mm -hmm. to kind of get some framework of a commitment down, but we fully intend to work with way more than just that. We, we reached out to UMass uh, Eisenberg School of Sports Management. They have a great program there that we'd like to be part of. Those are the natural ones that came to us, but certainly we understand there's plenty more underserved communities and groups that we wanna be involved in. Um, the, the issue is, you know, sometimes when we start these conversations, we both get very excited about it, but then we realize, you know, it's kind of a, a chicken and the egg situation of we need to get our license and know that we're operating there before we can kind of really get into further details and specifics of what we'll do and how we'll benefit each other. But I think we, we as you see throughout our application and our presentation today, we're very much committed to being in Massachusetts, being on the ground and working with uh, underserved communities there and partnering with the right 
um, you know, universities, secondary institutions, wherever we can to kind of make a difference, particularly in those communities that are more um, vulnerable. Uh, but this was kind of our first cut at, at folks that we had relationships with and were able to at least kind of get something on paper to show that we were serious and not just, you know, floating names out there. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Commissioner I'll, I'll yield the floor to whoever is ready to go. Commissioner Skinner, there you go. So I would typically ask the questions relative to employment opportunities within Massachusetts, um, but I, I want to echo uh, Commissioner O'Brien's sentiments uh, in noting that uh, the piece of the application that speaks to that uh, is very thorough, and I appreciate that. Um, noting in particular the letter of intent with the real estate brokerage and looking forward to uh, developments uh, in that area. I also um, wanna take the time to thank Mr. Paul uh, for participating in this proceeding today. Um, it does demonstrate in particular in my mind, a commitment to Massachusetts. Thank you, you know, I'm excited to be here. Madam Chair. Yes, so, so when we're talking about employees in Massachusetts or proposals for uh, employees, I want to be very clear that we're talking more on the better media side than we are the better gaming side. I think you said that in your presentation, and I just want to make sure that we're clear about um, what employees you're looking at at this point. I think I heard you say that most of those that would be hired here would be would benefit the media side more than the gaming side. Is that an accurate I, statement? It's, yeah. it's all, yes. If I can just jump in, I'll turn it over to Elizabeth in a second. But yes, you know, this was an initial cut of trying to identify where opportunities were and the immediate ones that came to us were on the better media side. But again, it is all one company. I know we were looking at the org chart earlier, but it was actually, it's all one uh, company. And, and Liz can certainly elaborate on some of the better media opportunities we identified preliminarily. Yes, I think um, as Ashwin said, you know, we are looking at, um, you know, crawl, walk, run in our hiring phases within the Commonwealth. So looking at near term six months, um, immediate hires would be on launch activations, production resources at a local level, as well as, um, you know, from an integrated marketing standpoint, which is reflective within the, what are the LOIs within our application, um, a company based in Newburyport, for sure. Uh, as well as others that we're looking to identify uh, for subject matter experts within the state of, of Massachusetts. Okay, we just, I wanted to be clear about that at this point. But, and I also want to just give some kudos to the, to the group uh, for your application in regards to um, reaching out to the community. That's something that I really is near and dear to my heart. And I saw the organizations that you hope to, to be part of. And um, we feel as a as a commission that this is important that you have community involvement and through your application it looks like this is a priority for you folks as well so kudos to that and and hoping that that comes uh, to fruition should you be given a license here in Massachusetts. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Other mm -hmm. commissioner Maynard. I apologize for circling around in this section. Um, but some of the other comments from my colleagues um, brought, some, brought some memories to the forefront. Um, I don't know if the percentage is out there or not publicly, but I will say that you have some philanthropic um, goals that you wanna hit um, over a five year period. I wanted to, to give you an opportunity to talk about that. And I did notice that you said the spin would be local, not just you know, company wide. And then I wanted to know, and we heard a little bit about it from Mr. Paul, but um, how, how you plan on bringing boxing bullies to the Commonwealth. I was very interested in that program. Mr. Paul? Do you want to start first? Go ahead. I can kick it off. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, so I mean, uh, boxing bullies, uh, we, we have funds um, and a staff of uh, three full time people. And um, what we do is we identify a gym, typically like in a lower income area or a gym where there actually is a lot of boxing activity or boxing interests. And uh, what we do is we get in touch with the, with the gym owner and we offer them a complete renovation of their gym and sometimes even 
um, an expansion um, and hire general contractors to go in, uh, redo everything, brand new equi equipment, supply the, the gloves. Because um, a lot of times, and if you have been to many boxing gyms, it's, it's very, very outdated. Um, boxing had like a lull period for, for about 10 years, 15 years or so after sort of like the Mike Tyson era. Um, and now it's, you know, it's back up on, on an upswing. Um, but we go and renovate the gyms um, and basically make it so that anyone within our like outreach program or anyone who uh, wants to, to come into the gym, then it is, it is free. And um, there's no fees for anyone coming into that gym uh, moving forward and it's covered by boxing bullies and like a partnership program with them. Um, and then typically, uh, I'm making my rounds to each one of the gyms to do an in-person event. Uh, we've already done it in Miami, Arizona, um, Cleveland. Um, I'm, I'm blanking on New, uh, New York. Um, I'm blanking on another big one, but, um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go in person and use my social media outreach to let people know where, where this workout is going to take place. And now that this gym is available uh, for usage, and then usually there's anywhere from 50 to we even had up to 200 kids um, show up and I'll put them through a workout um, and give them a message about bullying. And it's, it's very near and dear to my heart uh, because when I was a kid, I was a bully. And then growing up, I was bullied um, for, for my social media videos and such and cyber bullied. And I see how big of a problem it is with people making fake accounts and fake usernames to talk about, um, you know, peers in within their school. Um, and so I've been on both sides and I, I usually give a message to the, to the kids and encourage them to take up the sport because boxing gave me the confidence needed to, to feel with, uh, to feel whole within myself, um, and to mature a lot within myself. Um, and so just usually share that, that message. Um, and then we also have online, uh, help where, where kids can, um, you know, be sponsored for their fights. We, we send kids off to amateur tournaments. So if some, if a kid starts to take it very seriously, we then give uh, them the funds to continue their amateur career um, and send them, ship them to tournaments, flights, hotels. We pay for all that. We have two uh, actually amateur champions right now, uh, which is, which is really exciting and, and growing. Um, but this has all been in the past 18 months, two years, and we're, we're rapidly expanding and have, have um, really big plans and are ready to go. So uh, would love to, you know, figure out and identify a gym somewhere in Massachusetts. We have, we have a uh, bandwidth ready and, and just continuing to expand. So can move pretty quickly. Thank you. Yeah. And I to clarify if you don't mind a couple of things um i think in in any of our efforts and reinvestment into the community um you know there there's an investment in which we want to make into communities and parks and in various things that we included within our proposal um and those aren't necessarily directly tied to the better brand uh, those would not be a marketing effort in any way um, it's more just a reinvestment into Massachusetts, which personally I hold very dear. I have a lot of family in and around the Commonwealth. Um, and I think to Jake's point on Boxing Bully, we certainly want to look into uh, areas in which we want to build a gym. And again, that would be under a completely separate entity and brand, um, especially as it, as it is helping youth community, uh, which is not within uh, better demo to any degree. Do you want to touch on the last part? Yeah. <clears throat> and I, I can quickly touch on, um, you know, quantify, helping quantify that. We'll go further into detail, maybe an executive session, but, you know, 
part of our application, of course, is, is our commitment to philanthropy at the local level in Massachusetts. And that's something that we're certainly looking forward to. And, uh, you know, we made the commitment over, over the length of the, of the license um, to donate locally 10% of NGR and that gaming revenue. And that's something that, that we hold firm on that commitment and are really looking forward to. And again, we can get into more specifics on, on those projections um, in the executive session. Thank you. Commissioner Mayor, I offered um, that perhaps an executive session would be appropriate for more detail. Are you satisfied with their answer? I'm, you I'm satisfied with, with your answer today, along with um, the materials we have. Thank you. All right. Um, other, Actually, other, if I could follow up on that, Madam Chair, sure. before we move on. Um, so one of the things I'm conflicted on on this application is you've got tremendous plans and opportunities in the Commonwealth and what you just described is one of them. And I appreciate that you're saying you're gonna to try to draw this line between the charity work and the, and the, the betting component of your business. Um, and this is something that I'll touch on again later, but I, I may want more information on how you plan to sort of divide those spheres um, because Mr. Paul is a big part of what is the draw for the betting business. And then he's also gonna be a big part of those appearances in the charity. And so I have a, I am struggling with that dual role of a figure that we will, again, you know, Mr. Paul will talk about when we get to suitability, but um, I may need more information on that in terms of, and, and maybe it just comes in the general area of suitability, but I don't want to detract from the charity work itself and from the mission and from the prospect, but I did want to bring that up as a concern that I have. And to build Thank on you, that, Madam. Madam Chair, uh, just to build on, on what Commissioner O'Brien is concerned about, I'm also concerned about uh, Mr. Paul as an athlete um, in terms of what um, the offerings are uh, and the bet yeah, better I, platform. Yeah, I can answer that. Right now, we do not plan to offer any, uh, any combat sports. Uh, we don't have that on, on the roadmap, so any kind of boxing or MMA. At the same time, uh, we have engaged with other regulators to clarify that, you know, what would be the offering. And it's, it's obvious for us, it's clear for us that we will not be able to offer any event in which Jake either takes part or is a promoter or supporter of like fighters or cards. So we will not offer uh, fights in which or events that Jake takes part or uh, organizes. Madam Chair, since the issue has been brought up and the door has been open, um, I do have a question regarding that. And Mr. Paul, I appreciate you being here as well. I heard one of my fellow commissioners say that earlier. Um, this, is, this has been an issue that uh, I've been concerned about um, since I've seen the application and, and it's a great application. Uh, I'm very worried with, with the fact that you actually have a partnership I believe, and, and help me with the Professional Fighters League, I believe it is. Um, and the MMA is, is one of the biggest sports for betting. And I, I find it hard to believe that your, your um, company would disregard that entire section of betting uh, as it is something that you would make money on. I'm hearing that that's something that you're saying will happen. I find it hard to believe that that will continue to happen once we start seeing how much money can be made with MMA fighting. Do you want to touch upon it now or do you want to wait until we get to the suitability piece? It's well, up to you, Madam Chair. Mr. Paul, just one minute. Um, it, I think it's, it's very fair. I think it's an overlap to Commissioner Skinner's question. So it's a very fair question to answer. Um, I would, I, if I could, if I could just ask a clarifier. And then I'll turn to um, um, uh, Mr. Kirshen and uh, Mr. Levy, and then Mr. Paul. But Mr. Levy, your application suggests right now that the offerings are going to be limited in scope because they are most germane to micro betting, you know, basketball, football, baseball. That, and I'm missing another one. That, um, that's what we have today, yes. So your business model is based on a very more, much more limited number of events or sporting events than what we've seen with respect to other applicants. Do you want to clarify about 
whether or not that, that's going to expand um, as your business grows in that model. And then I suspect there's a legal answer to how um, you would be um, putting up guardrails around any events for Mr. Paul, but I don't want to speak for you, but Mr. Levy on the first point, that'd be really helpful. Sure. Yeah. So, so as noted, um, American football, both, both college and, and NFL, uh, baseball and, and basketball, uh, both, both uh, college and, and NBA uh, are the extent of our product offerings today. Uh, as I've also alluded to, we're, we're taking quite a, a different approach to, to uh, quite a different approach to product than some of our competitors where we really want to, to stay focused on our core experience initially and really get to a place where we feel good about our, our value proposition to consumers and that we have product market fit. And then over time, uh, we, we will invest resources into adding other offerings. Uh, but as Alex noted, we, we have a very focused near-term product roadmap um, that, that we anticipate on, on sticking to in, in, in the near to, to midterm. Um, but, but we do plan on expanding to, to other sports. And um, we're going to be very sort of methodical with how we do that, particularly with respect to MMA and you know, UFC and PFL and, and boxing and, and some particular IP that, that, that Jake, who you know, alongside myself is the largest shareholder of this business, may, may directly be involved in because um, you know, we, we, we would not do anything to potentially um, you know, even provide the, the sense that integrity uh, with that IP may be compromised in any sort of way. Yeah, just to piggyback on that, um, since you asked for a legal answer, that, that's exactly right. Any, any, we didn't intend to say that we're not going to offer MMA altogether. Uh, any, any fight that Jake is involved in, interested in in any way as a promoter, any, anything that of that nature, yes, will not be on our platform. But anything that he's not in, in, interested in in some way, but is MMA, um, you know, we, we could put on our roadmap. So just want to clarify that not the whole category is, is out, just anything that Jake would have a conflict. And I think to, I'm sorry, Mr. Pons. Yes. You no, know, and I think to, to add to that is like always leading with integrity first and not just seeing dollar signs and, and you know, get just getting excited because of that. I, I think all of our decisions are, are based around integrity first. One thing that I'll add to, to clarify here is, you know, we, we did have a lot of success launching a free to play game called the, the Paul Silva ticket around Jake's last fight. And that was free to, to enter. And there was a prize for consumers. And it ultimately proved to be a, a, a great thing for, for fans that were uh, engaged with, with that event and also a, a strong customer acquisition tool for us. So <clears throat> wanted to point that out as an example of you know, us taking advantage of, of the relationship with Jake and all the enthusiasm our audience has around combat sports while, uh, you know, erring on the side of caution and not doing anything with respect to, to real money sports wagering that uh, may, may, you know, not be viewed of, of, as having the, the utmost amount of, of integrity. Commissioner Hill, did you have a follow-up question once you heard those responses? Not at this time, Madam Chair. Commissioner Skinner, you and Commissioner O'Brien, you. Um, I, I, I did actually. To the to the point of, uh, and I'll will tell you very candidly that makes me very uncomfortable that you're going to have, you know, a large shareholder and a potential mobile betting company actively participating in a market where he, on occasion, um, would be one of the product offerings, even if it's temporarily blocked in your platform. Uh, and the question of conflict of interest is you know, what is the board and or the standards that are out there for MMA, martial arts, et cetera, that would then be the arbiter of whether or not there was a conflict of interest apart from just his clear participation in an event, uh, it could go and extend it to other things. So I'm curious what the framework is for identifying those conflicts. Yeah, I mean, I, I as I think we've all alluded to, this is far on our roadmap, nowhere near kind of in the near term, we'll be offering MMA or um, anything that Jake could potentially even be involved in. But we would certainly look to work with the commission, look to work with any other um, you know, regulatory body that we would need to, to make sure all those safeguards are in place. We don't have them at the moment because it's not kind of a current issue, but we would absolutely make sure everything was done as Jake and Joey alluded to with the utmost standard of integrity and making sure that everybody knew that we're not, you know, that, that that's our guiding principle. 
Um, and, and, you know, we would absolutely work closely with you to make sure that was paramount. So am I reading the answer to the question that there does not exist at present conflict of interest rules or guidelines by the MMA or the Players Association? Yeah, I'm sorry. So the leagues themselves may have, the UFC may, may have, uh, you know, conflict of interest, we say they have put forward, um, but that would be, you know, that's not something, that's not something that has entered our ecosystem yet because uh, we're not offering anything UFC related. We're not offering anything fighting related um, in terms of our product offering. Commissioners, um, I, we have our, our, our folks from GLI who have come into the picture. Um, so actually, Madam Chair, before we move on, um, I just wanted to, I can close out the query with basically saying that I, I can appreciate what you're saying, but as a regulator who's being asked to give a license, um, the sort of what you will deal with it later idea um, is not a, doesn't give me great comfort in this area. And I'll leave it at that for now. And, and, and Commissioner O'Brien, I didn't mean, I, I'm wondering if Joe is going to share something. Yeah, I just. We can return to you, Commissioner O'Brien. Right. Yeah, we're not closing this out yet. Yeah. Can, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, just, I just, I think it's my, our, you know, GLI's place here to just uh, kindly um, note that under 205 CMR 247.03, uh, the petition to support uh, for a sport event or wagering category uh, the, would, the MGC is actually in control of the events to be wagered on here. Um, so if better wanted to actually put this on their product, they couldn't do that just by themselves. Uh, uh, they would have to bring this forward and, and, and you guys would have to look at the, uh, how the, uh, Mr. Paul's event or whatever it is, doesn't even matter, uh, uh, um, uh, would, you know, how it's sanctioned, um, and how the event is uh, verified uh, and, and the integrity behind it. So you guys are at full power here. Uh, that part of um, the wagering catalog is coming up, I believe, this week. Thursday. Uh, yep. And, and so uh, just a brief reminder that it's clearly written in the, uh, the regulation uh, that you guys are in full control of the, of the events to be wagering. So, okay. Madam Chair. Yes, Commissioner. Yeah. Although I understand that, we, uh, we look at Mr. Paul in this case in other jurisdictions and what goes on in other jurisdictions when it comes to suitability. And I have a very big concern when somebody who has partnered with somebody, and in this case, the PFL, and could be somebody who would be involved in a fight, even though it's not happening now, nor is it being proposed, that moving forward, it doesn't pass the smell test as we used to like to say. And I, I know I would use this as an example, although I know the PFL and I know UFC are two totally different things, but if Le LeBron James, for example, was a major partner in, in a company that did sports betting, there's no way the NBA would let him be playing in the NBA under their rules and regulations. And I guess I am not as up to date on what the rules and regulations are of each league, and in this case, PFL or UFC, and maybe I need to educate myself a little bit better on that, but I can't imagine for a second that this would be allowed um, or that concerns would not be brought up. And then my last question, Mr. Paul, you received your Ohio license. Um, did you get your license before you made your partnership with um, PFL or were, your, were you already partnered with them when you got your license? Um, we, were, we were already partnered on paper with the PFL, but it wasn't publicly announced. So I think the follow-up question would be, um, and, and I don't know, Mr. Paul, and we don't want to put you on the spot, but perhaps counsel, was it, um, did Ohio, the regulator know of it? Perhaps that's most helpful. No, yeah, the answer would be no. And I, and I think just like the thoughts here are, um, if there is any conflict of interest, it's not like a, we won't even go near it. And 
if it's something where the, the PFL has to be excluded, then I, and I think Joey would say the same thing. Like we, we, that is not in our, it's not a concern to us at all. Yeah, but it is, but it is to us. <laughs> oh, I think Mr. Paul is saying it's not a concern that they would just not be involved. I and, and I think he's hearing you. Yeah. To, to reiterate it, what, what Jake said, if, if, uh, if if it were determined that prohibiting betting on PFL would would be required to, uh, you know, pass the smell test as you put it, Commissioner Hill, we we would be happy to abide by that and, uh, you know, to to do whatever it took to to uh, uh, operate with the utmost integrity and, and not have any sort of potential appearance that things weren't totally above board here. And, and Thank I you think point out that you know, even with the UFC, there are, let's say their partnership with DraftKings, there are still um, fighters around the organization who promote DraftKings through separate deals um, and then go and fight. Um, so I, I don't know exactly how that works, but um, it, it is a frequent practice that I see. Thank you, Mr. Paul. Commissioner Skinner, I want to circle back to you because you also had an increase, and then I might circle back to Joe's point. Yes. So I, I agree with Commissioner Hill. I think this is an area where we could all use a little bit of education um, <clears throat> because, you know, I think it happens, you know, more than we realize um, just across the across the in industry in terms of sponsorships and the like, um, but by athletes. Um, I also uh, wanted to circle back to what uh, Joe was, was raising relative to our discussion this Thursday, and I'm happy to hold that until that discussion, but we have a set of regulations that we are preparing to review on Thursday, and I just I want to be sure, and I believe we have the actual offerings right? That, so, so I don't know if there's a decision that's going to be made on Thursday, but we, I guess- we may not. We may not vote. Okay. Sure. Okay. We deserve the right to vote. Yes, and and just a note, I see that Kevin's here too from you know another legal perspective. So Commissioner Skinner, nice. Yeah. So I just want to make sure that we do build in uh, the framework to um, to hold. Um, it, it, so I guess my concern would be if we approved an offering, whether it's this Thursday or subsequent to Thursday, um, does that mean that it's fair game for all of the licensed operators. That's what I'm struggling with. And that's what I hope that we can hammer out on Thursday, at least start to. And, and Mr. Malali um, from GLI, thank you for joining. And I see Joe is here still. Um, to Commissioner Skinner's point, um, you know, there, there will be a uh, presentation on potential uh, offerings and it might, might include uh, boxing, it might include MIA. Um, so, would how would we put guardrails up on any athlete, you know, that has an interest in an operator or, or some participant in an event um, from you know, this this kind of conflict of interest? How would you manage it? And have you seen it before, Kevin? I don't know if Kevin is live right I now. I just, Lally, yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't. Oh, there we go. Yeah, I, I would just echo what, what Joe said earlier. Uh, and, and this goes to the nature of how, how different this new category of gaming is from what you are used to. And the concepts we've talked about, about uh, re relating to operational risk control. You know, before you had slot machines, you had software, you had very prescriptive regulations, you lock it down, you tell the casino how the money moves through there. Here's how we're going to audit you. Boom. We're always going to do everything the same. Um, this, you know, the marketplace is changing rapidly. There, there are new consumer preferences and consumer behaviors, and these operators are going to react to that with both changes to the interface in which the, the consumers are engaging and the types of wagers in which the consumers want to place. All of that is under your complete 
oversight and control and will require your prior approval. Um, and there's going to be more of that than you are used to with, you know, with the occasional debt transaction or change in ownership or the other things that you're used to on the casino side. Um, these things are going to be more frequent. Um, so I don't think that anything I'm hearing here is surprising to me, but I think that the regulatory construct that we have proposed to you and you have been reviewing and, and, and as the regulations come up approving, gives you a large uh, ability to uh, control this and to have prior approval and sign off before it goes live. Commissioner, yeah, I, I oops, just sorry. ask for a clarifier on, on your point. So on, on Thursday, let's say um, the, the global list includes MMA and we're gonna have this on top of mine. There's an ability for us to carve out for particular operators and allow for other operators, correct? Yes, okay. that would be correct. <laughs> However, I, I would like to make a note here and a real clarification. While MMA is a uh, very big and wide sport, there is different governing bodies within that actual sport. And Mr. Paul can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think he's fighting for the WBC Heavyweight Championship uh, next week. He's uh, there's different levels in, in sanctions that, uh, that, that govern those bodies. So there's MMA, but then there's UFC that governs that piece. Uh, so that those specific things are, will be brought up. Um, you know, like there's NBA. I mean, I think there's close to uh, 300 plus professional basketball leagues or even more in the world. But, you know, there's the big ones that will be brought forward. Uh, on Thursday as to approve for the catalog. So that just, so just so we're clear, I, I, I understand all of that. And, and the concern that I have is more akin to what Commissioner Hill raised, which is the, the appearance, the reputation, the integrity, the broader understanding. And the fact that we've had to sit there and dissect um, is part of the part of the conundrum of this. Um, it, we can go into this in suitability too, but the investment of certain NFL players in the company as well. I, I've got a lot, there's a lot of layers to this concern for me that go beyond just a particular event in a catalog. Okay. Other questions then under section C. We didn't, um, Commissioner Maynard, did I miss it? But did, did you mention the response with respect to spend? That's usually in section D, correct? Oh, my, my mistake, I'm right. Thank you. Okay. I had noted it well. Everybody all set then with respect to section C. Um, I know we just had a, um, uh, a discussion. I'm not sure if it's exactly um, involved with uh, Section C, if it's more um, a Section G issue. So I'll take the temperature on this Section C. Did the um, applicant meet expectations? Commissioner O'Brien? I think on C they met expectations. Thank you. Commissioner Hill? I agree. They have met expectations for Section C. Thank you. Commissioner Skinner? Madam Chair, I'm very pleased with Section C. So I think that the section exceeds expectations. Did you say it exceeds? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Maynard? I believe Section C uh, meets expectations. Okay. So, and I, I agree again. Uh, I thought it was a very, a very good response. And I noted in one section, it was probably the best response that we've seen. Um, the idea that you're going to come to Massachusetts and, and you're looking for, for space, uh, that certainly is responsive to what you noted as the legislators intent, at least under the Expanded Gaming Act to make gaming an economic engine. So I, um, I hope that too can come to fruition. So thank you and, and uh, for, for any jobs, so thank you. We'll move on to D. Section D. Um,
any questions? Commissioner Maynard, would you like to lead on that then? Do you want me to roll this over from section C? Um, I, I know that all of us have asked the question about diversity spend, um, especially around supplier diversity, which is in the application. Um, I would take this time to commend um, the applicant on their answer. It is the most aggressive answer that we have seen. Um, I will note that um, if you miss your mark by half, you've more than doubled the most aggressive answer that I've seen yet. Um, and so, you know, I'm a true believer that, um, you know, uh, to do anything, you've got to set a goal. So I like seeing the goal and um, it's kind of fun to do the impossible. So um, I'm interested to see how this plays out. I agree with Commissioner Maynard. Um, I would also request that um, you provide your spend, your current spend, so that we can put your goals into context. I didn't see any, uh, any uh, raw numbers included in your response, though I do think, um, like my fellow commissioner, that it was uh, uh, one of the more um, responsive pieces that we've seen to this section of the application. Thank you. Just sorry, just we will follow up with that, Commissioner Skinner. Thank you. Other other um, questions under Section D? Just going to do my notes. I'm satisfied with the numbers. Um, the workforce, the diversity numbers and within uh, your workforce. I'm hoping that you can narrow down um, the stats for LGBTQ plus uh, disabled and veteran groups if, if you can and um, feel free to supplement that as well. I know you have a small team, um, but be interested to see what your numbers look like in those areas as well. We will do that. Thank you. I noted um, my um, overall comments on, on section D were very, very positive, particularly as an emerging company. So I, the fact that you're thinking in the right, at the launch on this, is, it matters very much to me. Um, I noted, and I think it was connected with the supplier spend um, at, and this might be a little bit of being responsive to Mr. Skinner's earlier question is that 75% of your organizational partners are small businesses and 25% are large. And that seemed striking to me because in many cases we hear that the applicants are struggling on how to get to any diverse numbers and suppliers spend because they're national organizations that are technology based and so it's hard to to develop that um, you are in the early stages so that may be one of the reasons why you have those stats but to the extent that they can continue to be cultivated and um, expanded upon uh, that, that's significant that's very significant and i know massachusetts small businesses would welcome the opportunity for that partnership Great, thank you. And we're excited to work with the Supplier Diversity Office. Yeah, they're, they're doing a, a great job there. All right, um, other questions on section D? Uh, I don't have any questions. I just wanted to reiterate that um, I like the candidness of the answer in terms of there was a lot that could not be um, put forth necessarily because of the age of the enterprise, but I did appreciate the goals and sort of the candid discussion about what you were doing. And I was struck also, like Madam Chair just said, on we've had other applicants come in and claim they can't get smaller businesses or diverse businesses. And so um, I was pleased to see that you guys have managed to do something in that area. Thank you. Commissioners? Okay. 
How do we feel about section B? Did it meet expectations? I believe have. it met expectations, Madam Chair. Excellent, thank you. I agree. Thank you, Commissioner O'Brien. I think it exceeds expectations, Madam Chair, both in form and substance. Thank you. Commissioner Mayor? I believe that they met expectations. Okay. Thank you, and I will join Commissioner Skinner. Um, <clears throat> otherwise. Thank you. So we've taken the temperature on section um, D now. We'll move on to uh, section E, responsible gaming. Commissioners, questions? So E, e and G are what most trouble me about this application. Um, and I will start off by saying there's a lot of the rest of the application that was unique and in-depth and really good to read. But I have a lot of concerns about responsible gaming and G and they are connected to something akin to what I brought up with another applicant, which is sort of this inextricably intertwining a media branch with a betting branch. And we have in Mr. Paul, someone who has a large social media presence um, and I laud the company for, you know, being out there about not taking credit cards, saying that you're gonna, you know, the 21 to 25, recognizing the, the extra vulnerability of that population. But I have a lot of concerns about the social media audience, the following, the demographics of that, and sort of the priming them to then jump into this um, and follow somebody when they hit 21. And so I have questions for uh, the applicant about if they can tell me what are the demographic breakdowns in terms of the following. There's a lot of pumping up in terms of how much Mr. Paul has out there and how much better has there as a following. And I'm wondering what the demographic breakdowns are on those various mediums. And if it's something that is somehow competitively gonna put you at a disadvantage, I'm happy to talk about it in an executive session, but I would like answers to that. Yeah, we would prefer just because it's internal proprietary data, we would prefer to share that in executive session, but we're more than happy to walk you through all of it. Um, I would like to have a more public conversation about in general, the concern that I raised, which is the overlap of um, sort of Mr. Paul's social media persona that crosses over the lines with um, him being the face of a betting company that would only be 21 and up. Yeah, in terms of Jake and, and marketing strategies around him, I think, you know, it, it's not just the Jake Paul company. He's obviously a, a huge part of, of uh, what we're doing, but also looking to bring in dozens of other creators um, to, you know, create this organic content on a, you know, 24-7 basis as outlined before and, and a testament to the growth that we've had so far. I think, you know, as we'll talk about in the executive hearing, um, demographic numbers in line, you know, across the industry with, uh, overwhelming majority being over 21. And, and that's who we're always marketing, featuring, targeting to in everything that we do uh, on the better channels. Yeah, it, it doesn't, it, it, it doesn't necessarily assuage the concern that I have in terms of um, the media company's efforts compared to the betting and that there's a, a possibly a conflation in the minds of the public. Uh, I guess uh, to follow up on a more specific question, another applicant, we talked about the social media posts of a media branch of their branding, and then they have a whole team that spots it and, and, and checks it basically for responsible gaming messages and that sort of thing. And that that will soon open up to sort of a more broad review of exactly what's out there. Um, and I'm, I want to know what the team has presently and what the plan is going forward in terms of that messaging. Yeah, uh, on the RG side, I think mentioned a little bit earlier in the presentation, but uh, top of mind in everything we do, every piece of betting content, uh, promotional content features a responsible gaming end card and captions in our copy. So you really can't consume any of the content that we're creating, uh, especially that is on the nose gambling and or promotional towards a state like Ohio or hopefully uh, Massachusetts uh, without you know being inundated with the messaging to uh, gamble responsibly. Uh, if you have a problem, we'll call the 1-800 helpline and to, uh, you know, 21 and over is, is key for us as well and included in that messaging. 
And Commissioner Brian, just to build off of that a bit further, is that the application predated our go live within Ohio. And since then, as Mike alluded to and, and said specifically, we have been called out um, explicitly for over, -community, over communicating responsible gambling and messaging. And uh, again, just to reiterate, for you know any organic content that we that we create, we will not include any influencer, any person, any staff member that is under the age of 21. We don't want to make uh, betting so much aspirational. We want to make it entertaining as the app is meant to do as well. So we're very conscious of that. And we, um, we're we really engaging our predominantly male. And, and again, we can get into more specific numbers in the executive session, but uh, the majority of our audience is, is well over 21. Right, I guess to go back to the main point of my question though, is what about review on the media side? Because that's an integral part of the branding for your betting side. And so my question is, what kind of betting standards review do you have on the media side? Gotcha, we, we set out, I worked with Ashwin and, and Robert to set out uh, guidelines for exactly how we handle all of our posts and what needs to go into each. And then every post that does get posted uh, is reviewed by our social media team, which is uh, being built out and, and already has uh, eight to 10 members within that team. And there's a leveling up process to uh, the social lead for all of those posts. These posts also uh, come through compliance. Uh, myself uh, and my, my partner who's not on the call, we also review these posts. Um, sometimes before they go out, sometimes we do spot checks after they go out to ensure they meet the standards. But we do impose standards. We have standards for, um, there are really gaming standards that we impose on the media post and um, we, we enforce those. And, and um, I, I appreciate that. And I do want to say that I did note um, the lauding that you got in terms of the responsible gaming messaging. And again, I think a lot of your approaches really speak to that. Um, it's the standards and things I'd love to see are not just restricted to gaming. It's sort of in general, the, the, the idea of um, and this, again, we can defer some of this to suitability, but the idea of needing to have honesty, integrity, and a reputation um, that's integral to a licensee in this field, I would want it to go beyond um, just the gaming standards. Yes, ma'am. And, and we and we have, mm -hmm. a, we can share with you um, some of those standards as well. Great, I appreciate that. And I should know that I appreciate um, too that you have, your independent compliance committee um, of all you know of, of individuals who independent from the company that I believe um, probably Mr. Warren should there be non-compliance um, well first off I am presuming and 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 Mr. Mr. Paul has a big following and and that's you know that's part of his brand but it does come with an additional obligation. Uh, because of the issues around age and responsible gaming for the company to keep close audit of, of the media, uh, social media postings. And that's, you're not unique. You're not unique. Uh, every company, you know, really relies on, on, on varying, uh, it's not influencers, just marketing approaches that require that social media watch. So I'm presuming that falls to you, Mr. Warren, and then should there be any issue, you have your independent compliance committee Ms. Ms. Tate, who has a great deal of experience um, out of Indiana and, uh, um, and the other two gentlemen. So uh, Mr. Warren, is that, do you have a direct communication with, with them or how is the structure for compliance purposes? Yes, ma'am. Um, again, I communicate directly um, with the social team. As the social team, uh, we came together actually to create the, um, the guidelines together. So social team will do their review, um, notify me, I'll do a review. Social team, we do have, I, I trust the social team in the sense that I've, I've um, trained them well. They go through RG training. Um, they abide by the guidelines that we set forth, but then I still do an independent review of the uh, material that's posted. Um, should there be any issue, I'll, di I'll directly address the issue or you know, depending, you know, certain um, criteria, we've, we've only been operational for, for a month at this moment, but, um, you know, 
quarterly we'll have our compliance meetings and that's when we'll come together and see if there are any um, issues that we need to concern and, and we'll do it that way too as well. And Robert and I escalate to the compliance committee. That's the that's the chain there and link to the compliance committee that helps oversee and uh, provide guidance in terms of these areas and make sure that we're on top of these things for the reasons you mentioned. And, and back to your original question, Commissioner O'Brien, this also happens in real time. We've set up a structure to, to feel comfortable, but if there's anything of question, it is always raised in real time as well to caution uh, another. Other questions on section E, responsible gaming. I have one more, but I'll defer if anyone else has questions. No, go ahead. Uh, I, I do have a question, but go ahead, Commissioner O'Brien. Uh, okay. I was gonna let Commissioner Skinner go just um, to see if that prompts some more thinking, then I'll turn back to you, Commissioner O'Brien. If it's a follow-up, I prefer that Commissioner O'Brien Go. Okay, thank you. thank you. It's it's not really a follow up, but it's more discreet. I think it's a yes or no, which is page one thirty five. You talk about having something into this commission within sixty days prior to launch in terms of an RG plan. Uh, and my question is, do you have sort of a corporate RG plan in general already approved at the board level? We do because we did have to submit something to Ohio. So yes, we do have something approved and we would submit that. We obviously wanted to take into account anything we learned as we went through the application process with Massachusetts, but we do have something that we could submit assuming that you know there's no changes required for Massachusetts. Okay. I have some mass specific ones, but I'll defer for Commissioner Skinner and I'll come back. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Skinner. So I like the concept of micro betting that you're choosing to focus on. I like the philosophy that you've identified in terms of um, the entertainment factor and not a means to make money. Um, but are you concerned um, that in your targeting, specific targeting or marketing to folks who are not traditional sports wagers will create a gateway of sorts for those individuals to expand their gaming practices or uh, wagering practices beyond the micro betting platform. And if so, how do you how do you balance your philosophy with responsible gaming? Yeah, so I think right now our focus is on on in play betting. We plan to introduce some level of uh, pre match bets, but again with the same user experience where we ask customers, for example, who would win, team A or team B, very simple to understand without the concept of, you know, the money line, plus and minus, really giving the opportunity for a customer to make, make a, a, a decision between at the best. Again, looking at the industry, not just in the US, but also in other jurisdictions, since the industry itself is moving, you know, slowly, but moving towards in play, we, we need to make sure we uh, we enforce the same uh, responsible gambling tools across the board. And if together with uh, MGC or any other regulatory body, we identify other tools that could help uh, in prevent problem gambling or uh, in actually encourage responsible play, we're, we're definitely interested in ex expanding that. That's why, you know, we go back to the example, decided, deciding to ban credit cards and to introduce the deposit limits on a certain age. We think that those are some measures that um, will be helpful and will allow us to, to, to basically educate customers towards a responsible play. And I think there are other tools that we mentioned that we, we are looking to introduce and it's our responsibility to make sure we, we bring the right audience. And it, you know if there are problem gamblers like, we and other operators need basically to uh, address that, that issue and uh, with uh, intervention. And I mentioned this earlier relative to the under 21s um, uh, and their ability to create an account um, without going through the KYC verification process. I raise it, um, and, and, and from my perspective, it seems an area of vulnerability, um, given you know, what we've heard over, over time 
where, you know, if violations occur, it's as a result of a systems failure or a switch that didn't get turned on uh, inadvertently, things like that. And so just my suggestion is to consider whether or not you want to maintain um, that practice. And I know we as a commission have heard from at least one other applicant that does not allow under 21s to register for an account. Uh, I, I, we appreciate the feedback and we definitely take that serious in consideration. I think we have been talking about it and we, I don't think we had like the right answer, but if that's something the commission feels strongly, we will definitely introduce that, uh, you know, full transparency that makes, you know, sign up harder, but we, we understand that. Also, I think it's, it's public knowledge that some of the operators that you already reviewed, you could go and create an account without actually passing age verification. Like we were more than happy to, to insert that and make sure that uh, with better, if you create an account, you're taking directly to the uh, KYC flow. And before you see the platform, you need to pass uh, the KYC checks. Like we're, we understand your, your feedback there, we appreciate it. And, uh, I think that's something we could definitely look and work together with you in, in doing that. If I could piggyback off of Ashwin real quick, sorry. Um, what, he, what he said was absolutely right. And, and I just want to make the distinguish. Um, I want to distinguish between the account and the active account. Um, when you create an account, you create the, the free money account, quote unquote. Um, so you would never be able to deposit or withdraw or uh, place a sports wager wagering bet without going through the KYC process at all. So um, I just wanted to make sure, I mean, I understand, again, we, we totally understand the um, the need, uh, the, the perception of there being an issue. And so we're going to explore, you know, it going straight to the KYC. But at the moment, I know you have an issue with them even being able to create the account. They do not create active accounts. Thank you. And then finally, Madam Chair, just an honorable mention of um, the proactive uh, step of meeting with uh, Mass Council on, on Gaming and Health. Um, so that's much appreciated. And thank you for noting it. My postscript would be, um, we are so delighted to have the partnership that we have with um, the Council and look forward to uh, you obtain a license for your um, close relationship with our very, very capable director of, of responsible gaming here um, who works so closely with our neighbors so, um, in, in our game sense program. So uh, we're very fortunate to have them as our partner. Michelle O'Brien, did you have a follow-up now? Uh, it somewhat follows up on what Commissioner Skinner just gave, which was, uh, I was happy to hear that. Um, I think it's the only, if anyone's done it, no one else has mentioned it. Uh, and I'm in part happy to hear that because the, um, the question in section E, the very first question of E1, one, one, I believe specifically asks for the answer to reference back to some of the Massachusetts um, responsible gaming framework, that sort of stuff. I didn't really see a lot of that reference in the answer. Um, so I would hope that if you are granted a license and you're back presenting us with a plan that you will take note of the fact that the plan should, you know, duly note your conversations with them. And then also the, what, what's referenced there in E1E. Absolutely. And that's why we um, reference the game sense logic model. We, we, uh, mm -hmm. we will absolutely work uh, with the Massachusetts specific resources to update our RG plan. Thank you. Other questions on this section? Commissioner Mayer and Commissioner Hill, are you all set? Commissioner Hill, can I take the temperature on this section, please? I would say in section E, they met expectations. Thank you. Commissioner Skinner? You. Commissioner Mayer? I believe they did. Commissioner Bryan? I'm gonna defer until I hear the specifics on the demographics um, in executive session. So let's discuss um, where we are with respect to executive session. Um, I think at the very beginning, Councilor Grossman, we, we um, acknowledge that in order to really get an understanding of projected revenues and the financial situation of the emerging company, 
we would need our assembly fulsome report, which needs to go in executive session. Commissioner O'Brien, I think you had a um, an earlier one, and I should have written it down, and I did not. Can you remind me of that? Yeah. Or, or, or Councilor Grossman. I think it came from Commissioner O'Brien. It had to do with section C and the clarification on the revenues. So it was related to what RSM will provide as well. Yeah, C2, okay. C2B1 and C2C1. Thank you, Crystal. Uh, okay. And, um, and, and just now, uh, the demographic breakdown on this, the various social media platforms. And that's something that we can discuss. I mean, that you'd be able to address if the executive session is appropriate. I believe so. I think that the representation was that that would be competitively sensitive information that would put them at a disadvantage if they discussed it publicly. Okay, yes. Thank, thank you very much. So, um, Councilor Grossman, does that all sound good so far? Yeah, so far, so good. Absolutely. There was one other I had that I'm not sure if you're interested in. Um, it came up at the very beginning as part of the demonstration. Um, there was uh, an offer to uh, make a, a, a demonstration with specific personal information. I'm not sure if that's necessary at this point, but I just wanted to circle back. I think it was going to be the use of someone's actual social security number. And um, honestly, yeah. I don't... I, I'm okay not, not seeing that. Um, <laughs> you need not share your social security number with me, but I think we're all set. I think the technology should demonstrate it and we're familiar with that function. Am I right, commissioners? We're all set on that? Agreed. Thank yep. you. We're all okay. set, but I, I think I, I, unless the applicant deems that a critical component of their presentation. We, we wanted also to show like the full, uh, no, we're going to assess the flow, but we're happy with, <laughs> with it. Oh yeah, thank you. All right, okay, so we're all set with that. So now we're going to section F. <laughs> Questions on section F, commissioners? That the general um, observation, uh, you you use your um, two platforms for the betting and air uh, um, PAM, and but you do use GeoComply, and you um, I, I do you have a partnership with US Integrity too. I think I recall that. So you are using some of the best of class um, uh, specialists on security issues. Yes, so we have a comprehensive and know your customer uh, partner that does multiple checks and they are looking at age. Uh, also, they are looking at specific flags like PAC or OFAC. Uh, so a customer can, can fail to, due to that. Uh, if you want, we can uh, expand into executive session who the partner is. Uh, and then in terms of geolocation, yes, we are using GeoComply, the industry leader in, in the space, uh, which is providing us uh, location services. And then for uh, sports betting integrity, we use uh, US Integrity. Uh, basically, we, we have a direct feed from them when uh, certain, you know, if events uh, are suspicious, they are letting us know. And at the same time, if we're seeing suspicious activity on our platform, we would uh, contribute uh, to that. The good news is that uh, from an integrity perspective, being a, you know, large in play operator, if there's an integrity, it's usually those are flagged well before the a, a game or a match starts and games are, uh, if, if it comes to that point, games are disabled by the time they are on our platform uh, just because all operators contribute to this uh, plat integrity platform. Commissioners, it's quite a comprehensive response. Any questions? Is that commissioners on F? I think I'm ready to say that F has met expectations, Madam Chair. We agree. I agree. Commissioner Skinner. Okay. 
I agree. Okay, then we'll move on to G. Um, and I know that as we move into G and suitability, there may be issues where um, the need for executive session arises. So we'll keep that in mind. Madam Chair, I had a couple of questions about the litigation matters that were included in the IEB report. And so hoping we could just get some additional information about the substance of each of those, particularly the defamation. Mr. Kirshner, um, Mr. Kirshner is yeah. that some, something that should be an executive session or is it public? Yeah, I would I, I would ask, um, you know, there's, there was a list in the IEB report of, of litigation matters. And I would ask that we could address those in executive session. Um, we, we feel like uh, these may constitute an unwarranted invasion of personal privacy or otherwise may be subject to confidentiality obligations or pending legal matters, which are not appropriate for public comment. Um, so we would ask that we try to address, you know, all of that first in executive session. And if it's determined later that, you know, something can be addressed in the public session, we, we work in that order so that we can be as transparent and forthright with you on, on all the circumstances uh, regarding those matters. That's not... Sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry, Commissioner Skinner. So, um, uh, did you want to pursue? Does that sound, if, if it's acceptable to go into executive session, did you have another question on that? or? No, I just wanted to be clear um, for the record which items okay. I'm interested in. Um, so it's that one, the one relative to defamation and then the one relative to an alleged sexual assault. Yes, those would fall under the um, statement that I made previously. Other questions under under B? So I have another question about another litigation that's in the public domain. Um, I can find the notes and I don't know if it was in one of the open source articles or not. Um, I believe it's a February, 2022 yep. litigation in which uh, Mr. Paul is named amongst others um, in connection with safe moon cryptocurrency. And that's um, right before the last page of IEB's report. Yeah, I believe that's still active litigation and we would appreciate the opportunity to discuss that fully in an executive session. Um, and, and, you know, again, if there are things that we deem can be public record, we're happy to go back to the public record and address it there, but would ask that we go first to executive session to hopefully give you as much context and, and information as we can. Actually, this might be a good time to jump in and say that we actually do it the other way around. We first yeah. talk about how much uh, however much we can in public. Um, and then if there's further detail to supplement the public information, we can consider going into executive session. Um, and the reason for that is that most, and I'm not saying all, but most uh, matters of litigation are public. Uh, complaints are filed, of course, in courts and they're matters of public record. Uh, most of the pleadings are public information. So we were going to first need to uh, pinpoint uh, the specific cases and identify which parts of them are uh, matters of public record. Certainly to the extent that uh, we're interested in understanding what defenses may be raised and things of that nature, that's certainly uh, protected. Uh, but uh, before we do that, we do need to review the matters public. Okay, understood. And I would ask uh, Mr. Abramson to help weigh in if we want to go, you know, go through these specific items uh, in the order that the commissioners raise them or however we'd like to do it. Councilor Grossman, the challenge for me on that is that if the commissioners start to ask questions, you know, we have one article. And you know, perhaps we don't really know what is in the public domain and what is not. Um, so if we start asking questions, we, we could be going into an area of litigation that is 
is protected. And so I feel like we've done the reverse recently, but I might be wrong. I feel like we just had where there was pending litigation that was a request to start and then come back, um, where we might understand the matter better and know what is in the public domain. But right now we don't really know what's in the public domain. So yeah, I mean, the best way to do it is to get a copy of the complaint so we can see what, what is in the complaint. I don't have the complaints here, uh, so I can't answer that question. Um, and then we can figure out what further information the commission might be interested in. Oftentimes, the complaint tells the whole story, um, and that, that will get you where you need to go. Um, other times, there are follow-up questions. So I don't... In the past? It is, I don't remember doing it the other way, but it is possible we did that at some point in a specific circumstance. Um, I, I thought I heard that in one of the recent hearings where they requested to go into the executive first so that we could give you a more fulsome uh, explanation because certainly what's in the complaint, you know, certainly in these headlines is not representative of we think all the facts and we'd like to be able to provide that which you, uh, you know, uh, stated, you know, touches on defenses and potential um, responses that, that are, um, you know, sensitive. Yeah, I think the only thing that we've been pretty consistent about though is referencing to them publicly to the extent that they can be referenced publicly so that we know, we know and the public knows why we're going into executive session. So exactly. to the extent that their docket numbers that you're aware equate to the references we're talking about, uh, they can be referenced so that it's very clear what we're going in to talk about. <laughs> Yeah, I agree that's at least a good place to start. I'm having a hard time looking through the IEB report and even seeing where these cases are. Well, they're so articles. they're not. They're yeah, it's, it's hard that that reference them. That's that's what's troubling me, um, Mr. Grossman, is that it's, a, it's an article. It's not the you know IEB summary of any kind of pending litigation. So I want to be mindful of, of their boundaries. I also need to make sure that we are fully in compliance um, with our obligations and the open meeting law. Yeah, I mean, that some of this- Because I haven't read any of the articles. So I don't, I'm just going off of the headlines that have been included in the report. So I don't know what's in the public domain and what's not. So I did link and some of these, I don't believe actually have cases associated with them. Yeah. And some of um, so right. one right. of the challenges is a lot of, some of the other applicants um, affirmatively disclose litigation, even if it was not technically, you know, knowable that it may risk $100,000 or greater um, at the end of a judgment. And the answer here was nothing was identified, nothing was self-identified. And so that's part of the conundrum that we're in is the open source does in fact then bring up related litigation. So uh, I don't know if you have, you, the team at Better, have the public docket references um, in relation to these articles or not. But again, there are, there's one or two I don't think are even litigation. Commissioner O'Brien, could we, um, there's, uh, there's many, um, I think, to be, to be fair, um, is there a precise list of, um, that you could ask about without, you know, adopting? So, particular position or, or, yeah. or making a declaration about them. So I had, I had three matters in particular that I wanted to discuss. Yeah. You might that, um, yeah. One, okay. I know is litigation, two um, are probably privacy concerns. And two of them have to do with sexual assault allegations that are referenced in the IB report. And the third is the litigation that I referenced filed in February of 22 relative to the cryptocurrency uh, and safe which I know that at least is in the public domain. And I don't know Commissioner Skinner there was something beyond those three that you caught that caught your eye in that article list. So those are three and now Commissioner Skinner. The two items that, that caught my attention um, have already been referenced by Commissioner O'Brien, although I, 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 I understand that there are two separate sexual assault allegations. There are two articles that reference that, those are the ones that I'm talking about. A single, about. Or, a single or, incident. Media, 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 presence, I should say. Okay. And so the other one, I'm sorry, was the defamation lawsuit. So and Madam, Madam Chair, I wanted to add uh, number seven to that list.
which I think is appropriate for this yeah. discussion. Um, and actually number eight, <laughs> now that I'm looking at the list too, um, I didn't realize that there was a suit associated with that. There's part of it that might be in the public domain, but. That's the defamation claim that I was referencing, I believe. I don't believe that's defamation. That's no, it's um, a little bit. Different. Looks like a civil settlement, maybe. Again, these are news. These are news <laughs> accounts. It's a, you know, I, I want to emphasize that, and it's the same, you know, just what's been picked out. It's not IEB summaries. Say summaries or things like that. Yeah. I, I actually have to retract what I said earlier. I did click on a couple of these. I think number seven was one. And I think there's a little bit more detail in the article, which I, I do want to say it, it's re, um, regards defamation. But this is part of the problem. We don't know what we don't know what is out there. Um, so it would be helpful to just kind of get a walkthrough of exactly what's um, pending in terms of litigation. So are you, are, you, are you pointing out my my concern, Commissioner Skinner, about what we're going to talk about publicly here? Without is that what you're saying? Yes. Oh, okay, thank you. I'm sorry, yes. Um, no, that, I just wanted to echo your concern, Madam Chair, and that's where we're gonna have difficulties of going between the public record and executive session in terms of straddling the line on all of these items. And that's why we had suggested we go to executive session, we give you as much detail as we can, uh, and then we can return to the public record if we determine that pieces of it are, are public and after you have a full understanding of, of what these matters are. Councilor Grossman? Well, again, I, I, it's it's best to do it the other way, but if, if it would be helpful to do it this way, we can try to navigate that. Um, so can I can. just say from where I'm standing in an in interest of transparency and trying to balance though, that the references one through eight, I believe are all um, news articles. So they're out in the public domain. So at a minimum, I think if we say uh, the page number and then, um, you know, even the date and the publication, the date in the article, because that is in the public domain and it would specify without going into further detail that would potentially not be within the public domain. Well, first off, I don't have a, for whatever reason, my pages are not numbered, but so. So these are, I believe, mostly on page 10 yeah. of the IEB report, is that that's what we're talking about, top of page 11. And that's exactly the issue. They're all public reports. So I, it seems to so, me that um, they can at least address what the allegation was. Yes, or happy is. to do that. Happy to address the article and the allegation. I just assume that you had wanted a more fulsome discussion of the defenses or more context and facts surrounding those circumstances some of which are going to go into the boundary of privilege uh, materials and things that we don't um, think are appropriate for public discussion. So I think if we go down the list and then you say the public consumption summary and then flag when you hit a, hit a privacy or a privilege wall. Could I, could I just ask, um, that, that's a good idea, but I, do we, I don't know if we have to go through all of them, but back to the ones that are of particular interest or are you saying you want to- I, there, there are 10 on the list and, and some of them duplicate topics, but okay. to be blunt, Madam Chair, um, it is a, it's one of the concerns that I have with this application. So mm -hmm. I actually do want to hear about all 10. Oh, well, I asked only because we had, we went from three to now the 10, so- Well, because uh, to me, in my fine. estimate, it might be yeah. three that arguably would then venture into executive session territory, but you know, counsel for better may in fact have more information than I do about information that goes beyond what I know, obviously. And, and maybe it also will uh, also satisfy interest. Um, right. Mr. Um, Krishan, I think I'm going to ask that you manage this um, the best you can for your client. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I'll call on Mr. Abramson to help navigate these items as you go through the list as well. Thank you. Does it benefit you at all to take a short break to get the list together? Or are you guys ready to go? Uh, Mr. Abramson? 
I think we're ready to go. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Abramson. Want to, you want to ask a specific question or? Um, well, the question, the, um, as you can see on page 10, I'm sorry if it's not numbered, but um, it's, it starts with um, number one, a CBS News at the top, but that's not the list that we're looking at. We're looking at the next number one. Um, and Commissioner O'Brien has asked if you could walk through each item uh, to the extent that it's in the public domain without um, either compromising um, what could otherwise be subject to an executive session. Of course, we have to always check on that. So, um, yeah. Okay. Um, Jake, do you prefer to give a statement or do you prefer that I do so? I, I don't have a list in front of me of like which one is listed at number one or two or whatever. So I don't know. Me I wonder Maybe if someone can make a suggestion have to have Mr. Abramson. Yes. You, you just say at a high level what it's about. Um, I want to, you know. I don't know if there's also you, any way to get Mr. Spaulding. Maybe you the list. Um, you know what? The first time. Sorry. I'm sorry. Do you have it now, Mr. Abramson? Um, I believe so. The first one that the um, people.com. People.com. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Arizona Mall. That one, yeah. like me to take this shake or um yeah yeah no i mean i think to set the stage i appreciate the the commission for the opportunity to be heard on these matters and i respect this process i think just by way of background uh the reality of my life as a young and highly visible digital creator was quite different than the normal teenage experience the best way to sum it up is that everything is exponentially magnified you live quite literally under uh, a microscope and you certainly get more opportunities but you're also taken advantage of more often um, mistakes magnified publicized and republicized um and, and you become a bigger target for frivolous claims, lawsuits, media headlines, um, and many, many other interests uh, for, for and, and competitors and for people to make money off of, off of your um, demise. Um, the public and, and media also confuse your per public persona with your real life, which is quite a lot for any human uh, to balance, but for many years, headlines with my name uh, garnered a lot of attention. Uh, at one point, specifically just with TMZ, uh, every time I, I was their most clicked article, anytime they would publish anything about me. And so I've become accustomed to reading many false or exaggerated stories about my life with catchy headlines for clickbait and for monetary compensation for these um, brands. Um, from what I understand, there's over 229 million search results just in the past 12 months when you Google my name. Um, and of course, some of these uh, are going to be negative articles. Um, and I've unfortunately become accustomed to being a target for unwarranted claims. Um, and like everyone, I've made my share of mistakes and um, have messed up and ha have grown up in the public spotlight and, and done stupid things that from what I've learned from. Um, but as you will see, these matters generally don't warrant this level of media coverage and attention. Um, you will see that also in general, uh, nothing or very little has in fact come from these sometimes shocking headlines and and crazy situations, which are great for views and, and clicks and for me to be made an example of. Um, I've never been convicted of a crime and while frustrating these experiences have helped me grow as a businessman and a public figure and a human and um, I've become hyper aware of the projects I support, uh, the brands I lead, the, the things I do, the people I surround myself with um, and I'm grateful for all of my experiences and the awareness and wisdom they brought me um, and, and continue to bring. Um, and in, in terms of reputation, you know, I think 
we should differentiate from the fantasy world of, of social media where rumors run unchecked um, and in real life, I have a stellar reputation in business and the professional world, having worked with many brands, boxing commissions, talent, uh, the largest sports promoters, Fortune 500 companies, um, and organizations with absolutely no issue, no disputes, and in almost all cases, repeat and ongoing business. Um, <clears throat> so... I guess, yeah, I guess that is just to like set the stage before um, delving into any of these. Um, but can go back to the first one. It, is it people, people.com? What, what's the. About the Phoenix uh, civil rights demonstration. Yeah, no. So um I happened to be in Phoenix during the George Floyd civil rights demonstration. And um, I left dinner at a restaurant outside of the local mall there, there and um, noticed a crowd of demonstrators marching into the mall. And uh, along with the group of people I was with, we were curious and followed the demonstrators into the mall and were in supportive of the, of the George Floyd um, protests. And my videographer was with me at the time. We're always making videos. And what I was witnessing was the, the craziest thing um, I had ever seen. Um, and as a content creator, made the mistake of wanting to capture that moment to document it. Um, and we were present in the mall. Um, but did not take part in any vandalism or looting. And I resolved the matter with a misdemeanor uh, trespassing plea. I'd like first to go to the next one. Please. Yeah. The next one involves the uh, FBI warrant at your house. Um, yeah, so my home was... Uh, you know, to my knowledge, this was related to my presence at the civil rights demonstration in AZ. Uh, no charges were filed against me as, as a result of the search. Next item is a uh, article relating to Justine Paradise. Um, yeah, I'm, I was... Uh, I was the target of an unfounded and false allegation that was posted by someone online. Um, though the post received predictable online attention and was, I believe, purposely uh, put out the week of my fight um, to put a fork in that. Um, there was no truth to the allegation and at, at, at all whatsoever in no way, shape or form complete blasphemy and uh, nothing further transpired. So I, I do have a follow-up question on that, not onto sort of um, the substantive allegations in that video, but a, sort of a sub detail in there um, that I would like to ask and counsel, obviously you tell me if you think you're gonna advise me not to answer, um, but there was a representation made about sort of any documentation that might've needed to be signed prior to going into your, your home or your studios, an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement. Can you speak to that allegation? Anything relating to Jake's business practices in that respect, we'd like to take up in executive session. So it's a business practice for executive. Okay. The subject matter would be a business practice. Okay. Uh, Can you just add that to the list, Todd? Council Grossman, he's framing it as a business mm -hmm. practice. Um, do you want to do a follow-up question to just say, is it about competitive disadvantage or language that we would need for an executive session? Yes, thank you. So, uh, Councillor, Mr. Paul, the exact, uh, there, there's two legal standards uh, to consider to determine whether we can uh, discuss this in executive session. Uh, and the first is whether the matter is competitively sensitive um, to the extent that if disclosed publicly, it would place you at a competitive disadvantage. 
Um, so that is the question as it pertains to the non-disclosure agreement at issue uh, that was inquired of. Um, the second uh, possibility would be that um, it, it could arguably implicate um, Mr. Paul's personal privacy, and I'm not entirely familiar with the nature um, of the agreement itself or, or what have you, but um, if it does implicate um, his personal privacy and would be an unwarranted invasion, um, that is another standard that we can uh, consider. Thank you, and I think more, more meaningfully, we would, we'd be speculating because I'm not aware of the document that Commissioner O'Brien's referring to in the first place. And so I, I'm not familiar with the article, I'm not familiar with what, what the quote was or the document. So um, I, I thought you were asking about a business practice more generally. But uh, no, it's a representation in uh, the video itself that that's such yeah, a document. Actually, we're not familiar with the representation. So we wouldn't have any further comment. I'd like I'd like to add because I, I don't take I never took this allegation lightly. It it breaks my heart. Um, if you know my character, and and the you know I don't I don't even like giving more attention and light to it. Um, but to add context, the journalist actively solicited on the internet for a period of weeks for anyone who had something negative to say about me. Um, and that journalist that was involved with this whole situation was recently banned um, from Twitter for, for false reporting. Um, and, and again, there, there's absolutely no merit to this. Uh, and again, complete, completely false and made up. Okay. So I, get, I do have the same question, though, whether or not there's in fact an NDA required to enter the, the studios or the, or the premises. I would be speculating. I don't have that information. Uh, I'm asking Mr. Paul. Oh, but you know what, Commissioner O'Brien, I just want to be careful. Um, yeah. Uh, lawyer, yeah I, lawyer. I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what that's referring to. Okay. Yeah. I think um, Mr. Abramson doesn't isn't familiar with either the article or what is um um uh, what you're describing. Oh, so. I, Mr. Mr. Paul is, and he's he just okay. answered my question to my satisfaction. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And, and actually, I, th I think we ended up answering both uh, the, these two items. They involve two different individuals, but the, the response is, is the same. Our, our client maintains it was a false allegation and there's no truth to it and, and nothing came of either of these two online uh, allegations. So that would bring us to the next item on the list, I believe. And the number, please, Mr. Abramson, so we are, we're all. Okay. Yeah. Um, seem, I seem to have lost that document. Um, does anybody else have this? Four, five, and six. Yeah, I think you're on number seven, uh, Council. Yeah, there were duplicates. So that's a four, five, and six, I think, are just have just been addressed. The next item it has to do with the matrim lawsuit is that is that correct on your list as well yeah okay well, yeah. Uh, number six number six i'm sorry is the um he said that it was the same response to the uh, same response okay yeah, thank you. The, yes thank you okay. um so so now we're entering uh, an item which is the subject of pending litigation and so and it's very early on in the litigation context. We're happy to get a copy of the complaint if you haven't seen it and provide that to you. But I, I would counsel my client not to provide any comment on this pending litigation at this time, other than that we're vigorously defending it. I'd be interested in a copy of the complaint, um, but then also a copy of your answer as well. There, yeah, there hasn't even been an answer filed yet, to my knowledge. When do you expect to file an answer? I would have to check with the council who's handling that matter. Thank you. Next item on the list, I, I'm sorry, I don't have the number, but it's, it has to can do I with ask, a- Excuse me, Mr. Abramson, can I ask um, Council Grossman, um, and I don't know if Mr. Abraham Abramson would be even in a position to share this. Could 
what they anticipate the response to be, the answer to be, be something that we could hear at this juncture in the executive session, if, if, um, if he's well, able to share that. I, I think if, if they're comfortable, in fairness, it sounds like Mr. Abramson is not at least the lead counsel in that case. Um, and I don't know that it would be fair to ask him to offer an answer to that question unless they're comfortable doing so, of course. I wouldn't have anything to add to that. Okay, thank you. Okay, then going on. Uh, the next item is uh, a 2018 article regarding a rental home in California, Jake. Got it, yeah. Um, yeah, this was uh, during uh, a time in my late teens when I lived in a rental house with a number of friends um, and it was completely blown out of proportion by the media. And again, my name was used in the headline to be shocking and garner attention. Um, this matter was settled and amicably, uh, amicably resolved. And then the last item is the safe moon matter that was referenced earlier in the discussion. And this is also a pending litigation matter, which is also very early on. Uh, I, I'm not sure that an answer has been provided on this one either. And the council is handling this matter is not present as well. We'd be happy to get you a copy of the complaint. And if there was an answer, a copy of the answer as well, that'd be helpful. Okay, commissioners, now that we've gone through that list, are we, um, are we satisfied in terms of asking all the questions and obtaining any supplemental information that we need? That would With be- the both complaints will be forwarded to us. I'm satisfied mm -hmm. at this point. Thank you, commissioner. Thank you. Okay, thank you, commissioner. As am I. Yep. Okay, great. Commissioner, no. I'll start with that. Right. So, um, and that's having gone through that list and section G in its um, fulsome review. Are there any other questions that are separate and apart from that exercise? We're going to have on the financial stability, we'll hear from RSM. sections and then we, we've discussed compliance. We've also discussed on um, uh, Mr. Um, uh, Warren's um, role in compliance and the compliance committee. Is there anything else with respect to section G that we need to discuss? I think the only other um, area of a questioning that I had concerning me and suitability is, um, you know, Mr. Paul talks about his, you know, experience being on social media, putting out, um, you know, the TikTok videos, YouTube videos, that sort of stuff. And there was an article, I believe, as, as part of IB's report that talked about um, sort of that, the repetitive references in some of the videos that you put out in years past that would be deemed almost predatory advertising in, in say, the UK. Um, the repetitive references to things. And if I can pull up the reference, if I can find the article. Um, I think it was on in The Verge, September 4th, 2018. Um, and so if, if, if Mr. Paul or maybe somebody from Better can speak to what if any changes are out there in terms of Mr. Paul's, you know, social media presence in particular when it comes to that kind of allegation. I think it connects a little bit to responsible gaming like we talked about and, and a little bit on suitability. What, what exactly are the, were the claims? Like, what does it say? Um, I thought this was linked into the IB report. You have it, um, Commissioner? Um, September 4, 2018. Um, I don't see that. I don't see that in the IEB report. No link to that one. Maybe I was looking on my own. I found that. 
there's three articles mentioned above the, the derogatory articles, um, and mm -hmm. I don't see a September 2018 one. Okay, it may have been when I was trying to familiarize myself with Mr. Paul. Um, I, I guess what I want to maybe speak to have answered is from Mr. Paul and from Better, sort of, and it speaks a little bit to what you talked about in sort of posts and things like that on social media. But um, one of the concerns that I have in terms of suitability and responsible gaming with this applicant is, again, like I said, the intertwining of the media branch with the betting branch. So um, to the extent that there's anything you can talk about in responsible gaming and your marketing that deals with, um, I guess, what the UK would talk about in terms of uh, pester power, repeatedly referencing something to try to get somebody to want to try it or buy it. Is that something that's part of you know, your sort of responsible gaming, responsible marketing lexicon. De definitely. I'll, I'll just say one, well, yeah, one thing on, our, on, on the better side uh, and, and on Jake's side as well, uh, while we're, you know, marketing micro betting and, and showing people engaging in the activity of betting and micro betting, we're both covering sports content, uh, an athlete who retires, I would say 15% of our total content is highlighting, you know, micro betting, give or take. Uh, whereas we're on the, on the media side covering sports in general. So uh, not super familiar with, with pester power, but from what you, how you described it, I would say definitely not. Yeah. I, and I, I think uh, like five years ago, again, the, the amount of uh, hit pieces and people trying to attack me um, it was absurd, but um but five years ago, I also was a, a YouTuber. I was uh, 20 years mm -hmm. old, um, not not mature. And now for the past four years, um, th three and a half years, I've been a professional athlete. Um, so I've, you know, gone away from, from that world as to, I don't really know what the article mentions, but um, don't even put out nearly as much content. And again, my focus every day is, is my training um, and, and focusing on my, my fights. So yeah, I guess I what I had... I'm sorry. Um, um, go, Commissioner Brian, Commissioner Skinner. Then... So I guess what I, the only thing I would ask is given, um, I can make the reference again for the record, September 4th, 2018, article on The Verge written by um, Megan, for Akmanish, it looks like, um, F-A-R-O-K-H-M-A-N-E-S-H. Uh, I just would ask that Mr. Paul and Better take a look at that. And if there's a supplement that they would like to give uh, in connection with their application in that regard, I would be, um, I, I would really wanna see it because it is part of reputation and character and suitability. Yeah, I think we would be happy to provide a supplement that addresses that. And um, especially just given that the digital ecosystem has changed. I think marketing and advertising okay. efforts have changed significantly since 2018. Um, and we're certainly keeping that in our in our focus and and making sure that all of our marketing and advertising efforts are given to those that are opting in and and willing and participating. So um, we'll take that into into consideration. We'll read the article and come back with a response. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other questions on section G? Okay. Um, hearing none, uh, in, in light of what we've asked for for supplemental um, information, did the uh, applicant meet this section? Commissioner Maynard, I, are you leaning in? Oh, Commissioner. Well, I think we were still getting information in executive session from RSM and some of that. So we'll circle too. back. Yeah. Okay. Um, for RSM, that makes sense. We'll circle back. Um, so in terms of going into executive session, there's a little bit of a process before we, um, we go into um, executive session. I guess I would just like to point out that as I look at this overall application, I was impressed by um, by its thoroughness, uh, and it was a 
a long but compelling read to learn about what is uh, an innovation in, uh, even though we know about in play, this is a, a, different, um, a different product. And I, I wanna extend my appreciation for this applicant's um, recognition that there's clear space for disruption, your word, and innovation um, in a highly, highly regulated landscape. And so I appreciate that you recognize that um, and that the two can intersect. And I'm, I'm gonna take Mr. Paul's lead. I heard you and um, it just was with a huge responsibility to play in highly regulated space. And you said integrity first. And um, I'm noting that as part of section G. Um, Mr. Paul, I heard you and so with that, um, I would just like to close out this and move into um, our process of going into executive session. So Mr. Roseman, we've got a list and then we just need to know if we can move on. Yes, Madam Chair, I have um, two, possibly three, uh, I think just two uh, items to uh, raise for possible executive session discussion. Uh, and the first, and I, I would just note, as was discussed, it's my understanding that this is a privately held uh, company, which means there's a, a good deal of non-public um, information relative to the finances of the enterprise uh, that are included in these reports and will be discussed. And so the specific issue for discussion in executive session um, relates to um, asking that RSM and the applicant discuss the financial projections uh, and the relation to the overall stability of the applicant, including a discussion relative to the market share percentages that are projected, uh, the revenues that are projected. Um, there, there was not uh, a great deal of discussion, but um, oftentimes it's helpful to hear about the handle and hold percentages um, and um, get some insight into those figures um, and any um, issues that are associated uh, with the aforementioned discussions as outlined in the RSM report. So that um, that's issue number one. And um, if I have that uh, correct, then that information would certainly fall under section 6i of chapter uh, 23N in that it is competitively sensitive and if disclosed publicly would place the applicant at a competitive disadvantage. The second issue for consideration relates to the demographics um, of uh, a couple of things and I wanna make sure that we get this precise. The, the first I believe related to Mr. Paul's uh, social media uh, following on a, a variety of platforms and how the demographics broke down uh, there. There was also some mention of possibly a, uh, the demographic breakdown of betters uh, projected patrons as it relates um, to the, the previous um, uh, matter. And there was, I believe if I heard correctly, some interest in hearing about um, the demographics of potential uh, targeted targets relative to marketing as well. Um, and I think there's a lot of overlap between those three categories, uh, but I just wanted to make sure I had that correct. And if so, um, those would all, uh, again, fall under the uh, category discussed in section 6i of chapter 23N, and that they all call for uh, the discussion of competitively sensitive information that if discussed uh, publicly would place the applicant at a competitive disadvantage. The only other issue on, on my list, and I, I think I, we have this resolved related to litigation matters, and it's, it's my understanding from that past discussion that we just uh, concluded that with the provision of the complaints and any associated filings, that there were no further questions related to the, any litigation or other uh, media reports. Commissioners, does that sound right? Yeah, with the only caveat that once we get the complaints, whether we have follow-ups, you know, would be um, still open for discussion. That would be part of our um, 
of our process on the 18th and 19th, and there's a process that would address any outstanding matters. Okay. All right. So uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Massachusetts Open Meeting Law, I'm required to read this into the into the record. And I, it's my understanding we're all under six I. Um, the, so the information was generated under 6i. The executive session provision, Madam Chair, that I think you're about to address um, is actually in, uh, yeah, so it's for. Uh, I don't D. think we have any N or C or seven, uh, section 726C, no privacy, and we don't have anything to do with public safety. So it's all just under competitive disadvantage. It's all 6i, yes, and it's <laughs> that's right. And it's entry 4D2 on the. Sure. Okay, yes, it's under um, the agenda item, which is what Mr. Grossman was um, referencing, is under 4D2, correct? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. The uh, <clears throat> commission anticipates that it may meet an executive session in conjunction with its review of the Better Holdings, Inc., Application in accordance with General Laws Chapter 30A, Section 21A, Subsection 7, and General Laws Chapter 23 and Section 6I to consider information submitted by the applicant in the course of application of its application for an operator license that is a trade secret, competitively sensitive, or proprietary, which if discussed publicly would place the applicant at a competitive disadvantage. Do I have a motion? Uh, Madam Chair, I move that we go into executive session for the matters delineated by uh, Attorney uh, by General Counsel Grossman and as stated by yourself. Thank you, Commissioner. Second. Thank you, Commissioner Skinner. Okay. Any questions, edits? All right, Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Hill. Aye. Commissioner Skinner. Aye. Commissioner Maynard. Aye. And I vote yes. Five zero. Now um, we will be transformed, I believe, or transferred into a um, another virtual room. So just join that, please. Thank you so much. Um, okay, sorry. I was going to ask, and we can do this in executive session, but a quick break before 10 minutes or so. I think she probably froze because she was moving.
I think we're all set, Dave, on the screensaver. Okay. All right, we're reconvening um, public meeting number 421 of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission after a short executive session. And um, because we're holding this virtually, I do need to take attendance. Commissioner O'Brien. I am here. Commissioner Hill. I'm here. Commissioner Skinner. I'm here. And Commissioner Maynard. I'm here. All right, we're all here and um, want to express my thanks to the applicant um, for its interest in um, coming to do sports wagering here in the Commonwealth and for its application and the uh, presentation demonstration today and um, very candid responses to all of our, our questions and for, of course, the executive session. Um, I, um, I want to give the opportunity for you, Mr. Levy, and, and anyone else to speak before I turn to my fellow commissioners. Sure. Uh, I'm, I'm good on my end. Uh, as I reiterated at the end of the presentation, really grateful for, for the opportunity to potentially receive the honor and, and privilege of, of receiving a license in, in Massachusetts um, and appreciate all your time here today. Uh, Ashwin, anything to add? No, just thank the commission and the staff for all the hard work and making this possible. And we really appreciate the opportunity to be in front of you today. Mr. Paul. No, thank you. And, and uh, I really respect this process. And, you know, I think what we're doing is, is really awesome with better. And I hope you guys see that vision and I'm um, excited, you know, to potentially work together. And uh, today's been, today's been really awesome. And um, you guys are obviously really great at what you do. Thank you, Mr. Paul. And with that, um, commissioners, I give you a chance to, to add in. Uh, Commissioner Maynard, I'll have you go first. Reverse order. Um, so I, I just want to compliment the applicant today. Um, you know, the application uh, included some of the most robust answers. Uh, substantially um, when dealing with goals on diversity and supplier spend. Um, and, you know, we have a lot of information that we go through uh, when we go through this process. Um, but I will say that, um, you know, um, I think that, you know, we probe, we're rigorous regulators, but sometimes, you know, um, we can over probe. And I, I just want to say that I believe that um, you held yourself um, uh, very well today. Thank you. Commissioner Skinner. Well, Chair, I know you're we're well into this piece of the uh, uh, proceeding, but did you want to take the temperature on sections? Oh, thank you. The team and G first. I said, that's why we we need team, right? Um, I, uh, this is evidence of friends and uh, colleagues, right? So as we just pause and I'll return to you, Commissioner Skinner for goodbyes um, with, um, uh, recognition that we do have some outstanding information that we'll get on um, on uh, suitability on on G. Are we set, um, Commissioner Hill? Do you feel that the um, applicant has met expectations? Uh, for Section E, they have met expectation and G as well. Yeah. Did did I? Um, so I guess it was E and G because of the suitability piece. Sure, thank you. Commissioner O'Brien, you're nodding, so I'll turn to you. Um, so yeah, it's E and G, um, and I'm satisfied with E as to G. Um, I'm gonna defer until I see the information on the complaints, um, but I think they'll probably have satisfied the minimum requirements. Um, so I can say that today, yes. You, you mean in terms of the overall application, uh, but you're, whole, you're, saying, you're stalling. Yes. Pausing on section G. Thank you very yeah. much for that clarification. Now I'll go back to Commissioner Skinner. Oh, you, you, no, that was Commissioner Hill, Commissioner Skinner, and then I'll go back to you for your regards. I feel that uh, the applicant has met the expectations relative to section E. 
Um, I'm with uh, Commissioner O'Brien. Uh, you know, I, I would hold on my rendering of a decision relative to Section G until we get the complaints. Okay. Um, Commissioner Maynard. I think they've met expectations. Yeah, and I believe they've met expectations on ENG and a reminder that um, should this um, applicant advance uh, um, in the process, there will be um, a full suitability um, um, investigation that's done with respect to all applicants. So um, I feel today um, the applicant's application was a very thorough and today's response is thorough. So I say they meet fully um, the ex um, expectations on, from my perspective. So now, Commissioner Skinner, what would you like to say? So just a thank you to Mr. Paul, Mr. Levy and team. Um, very thorough application. I think it's a strong application. I appreciate you actually taking the time um, to answer and uh, be responsive to all of our questions um, in the application and during your presentation today. I have no doubt that um, you will uh, uh, continue to be responsive in the information that we've asked you to supplement. And so I um, just want to wish you luck during this process and uh, look forward to further discussion on the 18th and 19th. Commissioner Hill. Thank you, Madam Chair. I too want to thank the applicants for a very thorough application, but more importantly for the forthright conversations that we had today. There were some pretty hard questions and I was very appreciative of the answers that we received from everyone. So good job with that. And I too look forward to a continued dialogue with you as this application moves forward. And Commissioner O'Brien. Thank you. Um, I, I've said it a bunch of times. A, a lot of the fellow commissioners have said it as well. Um, there was a lot in this application that was unique. Uh, a lot of detail about Massachusetts, a lot of detail on the responsiveness and the product offering, which I was very excited to see. Um, but I um, had equally an amount of concerns about it, uh, particularly when it came to uh, suitability. I thank everyone for their candor. Um, I don't think I did go too far. Anyone in this commission went too far. Suitability is a, is a serious issue been here five years and I know these can be very uncomfortable conversations. Um, and I laud everyone who candidly uh, answered the questions that were put in front of them today. So I thank everyone for their time and for their participation today. With that, again, thank you. Uh, thank you to the team in the room. Um, thank you to Mr. Levy and thank you, Mr. Paul. And uh, I ask now for um, a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Thank you. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Hill. Aye. Commissioner Skinner. Aye. And Commissioner Maynard. Aye. And I vote yes. Again, thank you. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.